two, two one. one, we're live. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a Brant County Council meeting, very special meeting, uh, July the 29th. It's a uh, very important meeting as we're going to go through a lot of business that's going to affect the future for many years. Before we begin, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Councillor John Bell for chairing the Brant County Health Unit. You saw on the paper today that the Brant County Health Unit uh, was recognized by the province of Ontario uh, as doing a stellar job um, in, the, in the province. And that is uh, to, the, to the benefit of uh, Councillor Bell, I believe in the chair and obviously Joanne Tober at the health unit and together they've made a great team and I'm glad that the province was watching uh, how we did it in the county. And uh, I was very proud to sit on that board. So thank you, Councillor Bell. Thank you. As we begin, I'd like to first of all take attendance. When I call your name, please acknowledge that you're here. Councillor Wheat, you're first. Present. Councillor McAlpine. I'm present. Councillor LaFerrier. Present. Councillor Howes. Present. Councillor Bell. Present. Councillor Pierce. Present. Councillor Chambers. Present. Councillor Miller. Present. Councillor Coleman. Here. And Councillor Gatward. Present. We're all here. The second thing on our agenda is the approval of the agenda, noting that number five has been added as an addendum, a transfer payment in this form of a bylaw, which we've added as number five on our agenda at the very end of the evening. Are there any other additions to the agenda? Seeing none, I'd like to have a have it move, please. Councillor Coleman and Councillor Pierce. All those in favor? Thank you. Any, any declarations of pecuniary interests? If one crops up on you, please don't hesitate to let me know. Moving on to number four, it's a public meeting, a, a draft of the new official plan. So I'd like to declare that this is a public meeting. And I will ask for the presentation to begin with Jennifer Boyer. And before you begin, Jennifer, thank you again for this report. It's, it's just a phenomenal amount of work mm -hmm. uh, and everyone who worked on it, I'm, I'm sure it's a, a moving document. It's, it's just incredible that this is what you've chosen to do for a living. <laughs> and how well that you're doing it. It's incredible. So thank goodness there's people like you doing what you do. So please begin when you're ready. Well, thank you, Mayor Bailey. I can't thank you enough and members of council for being here tonight and those very kind words. It is very much appreciated. As you know, staff have worked very hard and diligently to get this product in front of you tonight. And we're very pleased to be here. I'm going to ask Pam Dusling, our General Manager of Development Services, to just say a few words before we can begin. Thanks, Jennifer. Hello, Pam. Thanks. Hi, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd like to, to start tonight's meeting by thanking the policy uh, development team for all their work to date on the draft OP and also the uh, MCR. Uh, Anna, for all her works in GIS with the maps. Uh, Amanda, uh, one of our development planners for all your extra works. The entire Watson team, uh, Brad, and especially Jamie for all the MCR works. And finally to Michelle, Jessica, Brandon, and especially Jennifer um, for their countless hours on this project. When I think back over the last year and a half with all of the COVID-19 obstacles, um, this, this team has um, just amazed me that they have per persevered and they've kept on track meeting their timelines. The new draft OP is, in my opinion, a leading edge document. It is clear, concise, all-inclusive, and above all, it directs responsible growth for the County of Brant in the short term and in the long term horizon. There is still a long way to go with this project, um, but this draft uh, OPR is indeed a milestone. So well done, Jennifer and policy team, and I look forward to Council's direction this evening. Good luck. Thanks, Pam. All right, thank you very much, Pam. And I, as Pam mentioned, she acknowledged the staff that have worked on this project. And we also have many members of uh, other departments and also I have to thank Matt Vaughn and his team from development planning for all their input into the official plan as well. 
Uh, we do have other staff on the line as questions arise, um, but we are here for you tonight um, to answer any of your questions during the, uh, as the evening progresses. So as promised, we have a very short presentation. Uh, it's only 15 slides, and it's literally just an overview to give you um, some indication of where we're at and why we're here tonight. Um, and then, of course, we'll go into the delegations, and we are here for uh, any moments of clar clarification or questions. So I'll ask uh, Brandon to pull up the presentation and we will begin. And it will not just be me, it will be several staff as well who will be uh, presenting. Uh, so the first slide. Um, and I also just have to say as well, I would, as Pam mentioned, we have also Jamie Cook and Brad Post on the line um, as questions may come up regarding the draft municipal comprehensive review. That was also uh, in front of you for review. It's the 385 page compendium um, of detailed technical information. So. so I guess quickly we'll talk about where we've been uh, for those watching on YouTube and on the line, uh, just a quick recap of how we got to this process tonight in this date. Um, as you know, in November, 2019, we did the launch which honestly seems like a lifetime ago, pre COVID as we call it. Um, that's when we did the launch of this project. Um, and since then, it's really been something with uh, COVID and the lockdowns, uh, staff working remote, trying to move this process forward. And as you know, the province has told us and indicated in written correspondence and verbally that there's no extensions to the deadline to conformity and that we just have to persevere and move forward during this uh, challenging time of the pandemic. Um, so we started with a lot of policy themes and our engagement throughout COVID and last spring. Um, we came to you and promised you digestible pieces during the process. Uh, we did our policy themes and our engagement summaries last fall in October. We had our town halls, uh, our surveys online, consultation and engagement, um, working with our development community, getting feedback from them. Uh, we brought a report in uh, November and December on our engagement, but the biggest ones was when the change to Schedule 3, the growth forecasting came, and we brought a report on December 8th with our forecasting. And that looked at Schedule 3 of the reference forecast in the growth plan. And then in March, um, it was the first pieces of our draft municipal comprehensive review. So that's why the product in front of you tonight that uh, you have read for the draft is really no surprises. Um, everything we've presented you so far is sort of leading up to this point for the Municipal Comprehensive Review. Um, so March was a big report, a lot of feedback on our community area land needs and our public engagement summary piece uh, was focusing on our residential land needs. Um, and then in April, not long after, we brought the next sister compendium to their our land needs assessment. If you remember, all the way back April 22nd was our employment land needs, uh, which identified a, a shortfall of employment lands. Um, and then not long ago, uh, preliminary policy directions. So it summed up everything we had heard, looking forward to make some key strategic directions to move forward with the draft OP. And that was the big report that summarized the direction that would form the basis of the draft official plan that you have in front of you. So we took those directions and wrote a lot of words into policy. Um, and, that's what, uh, and that's what you have. And like I said, we have constant ongoing feedback uh, and we've especially engaged our indigenous communities, um, Six Nations and Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation as well um, to get their feedback as well. Um, our residents and stakeholders, we've had tons of emails and calls over the past week, if you can imagine, uh, throughout the process. So, um, and I just want to remind you of the, the timelines that the province are putting on to us. As they've said, they're expecting their final OP by January of 2022, and, and we are on track and ahead of the queue, according to the province. So, so I guess why we're here tonight, why are you here as council and some expectations? Um, obviously, this is a requirement under Section 26 of the Planning Act. Um, a draft official plan will be submitted to the province um, based on your endorsement, and it'll trigger a mandatory one-window review, which is 90 days. So the province then distributes it to all the partner ministries uh, and the Ontario Growth Secretariat for their feedback. Um, and we have had a lot of feedback from the province so far and a very good relationship with them. Um, and then... 
it's just tonight is really a major milestone in the process. Uh, we have another town hall for September 15th booked. Um, and then really, we're just here to present the highlights to you and to talk about initiating additional feedback and discussion. Um, but really tonight is about a draft product. And I've told everyone that we've taken everything so far, presented this in front of you really with not many surprises, but it is draft. Uh, we as staff have already found a few, few things we'd like to change. Um, and, but we're constantly initiating feedback um, and that's what we'll be doing from the summer into the fall months um, as we move forward. And you can see with our, our little famous rocket ship uh, uh, timeline that we like to show, we're actually, we moved already a step, which is exciting uh, with the preparation of the draft OP. So next slide. So I just wanna give an overview of some quick key highlights. Um, this is a brand new official plan. Um, when we were writing the draft OP, um, we did obviously refer to the older OP, um, but it really is a brand new product um, that we're quite proud of. And we'll explain quickly with staff um, how it is a new product with a new land use designation system. Um, and then really there's some key statements that the OP has in this. Um, really the new official plan for the county, the, the key highlights we see which based on the preliminary policy directions on June 10th. Um, but the, the OP itself, um, besides that, we're improving our Indigenous engagement um, and with reconciliation, you'll notice there's a, an acknowledgement at the front and also there's a section about how we can engage better. Um, that's, that's very big and we've had some excellent conversations with them. Um, we have a full growth management strategy contained in the OP based on our municipal comprehensive review. Uh, we're creating the strategic employment land reserve for future use at the 403, which is shown in the OP and the schedules. As I said, a new land use designation framework. Uh, we've really enhanced our environmental and agricultural and heritage protection policies. Um, and also in terms of the growth plan conformity. Um, a big thing that was lacking in our current OP um, in terms of some agricultural land protections and especially the agricultural economy and agritourism, um, that's been strengthened. We've got flexible housing policies and how we'll attain and have affordable housing moving forward. And a big one that we're hearing about lately in town is definitely improving traffic and infrastructure and transportation networks and what we're gonna do about parking solutions and everything and working with the transportation master plan. Um, and then we've actually developed a new county toolbox at the back of the report, the OP, and also how we will implement the official plan, which is extremely important. Um, but just highlighting some of the preliminary policy directions going back to June, some of it, as you'll know, is that we are not expanding the boundary of uh, Paris or St. George. Um, there's no settlement area boundary expansions. Um, we talked about the density and intensification targets uh, back in June. Um, we also have enough residential lands, community area lands in our primary settlement areas. We have a surplus that we're declaring, which is the excess lands. Um, and then in terms of our shortfall with uh, employment lands and the prestige employment lands and where we'll be directing those lands, uh, as you'll see as the We've expanded the settlement area boundary for Paris to include some parcels to meet our shortfall and then the future reserve as well as need arises. Next slide. So just quickly to highlight the growth management strategy. Uh, we've talked a lot about this throughout the, the months since December, moving forward some sort of strategy as councils directed to slow, to manage and slow urban and rural development over a 30 year horizon. Um, as we've indicated, there's enough residential lands in our primary settlement areas to meet our forecasting targets. Um, and as per council's directions, how can we come up with a strategy to do this over th not 20 years now, but 30 years? Um, and also directing growth, uh, major growth to settlement areas, um, you know, our rural villages and hamlets away from protected lands. Um, we also talk in the plan about a phasing of development plan corresponding with our infrastructure allocation needs and the timing. Um, the land needs assessment conclusions are summarized in the OP, along with our density and intensification targets. 
And then there's a brand new policy triggered by our surplus residential lands, which we, I'm sure we'll be talking about tonight, which triggers an excess lands policy, uh, which the province is watching us how we will apply, uh, which will need further consultation as we move throughout uh, the summer and fall. Um, and then we talked about our, our employment lands. Next slide. So you've probably seen this already. Uh, this is just a visual illustration, especially those who are, are watching on YouTube, um, just to indicate which lands we are recommending through the official plan as discussed previously um, for inclusion into the settlement area boundary of Paris. Um, so you'll see that uh, the top two parcels on the Northwest are added along with some along Bethel Road, south of uh, Adidas. And then we've got future strategic land overlay, which is an overlay, as I said, uh, as need arises. Um, but as we move through consultation, uh, we're working with those landowners and also operations department for servicing to see how this would roll out in the future. So everyone I've talked to is, is really quite pleased uh, with this approach. And I think with direction from council moving throughout that I think we're, we're pleased with this approach and the, the lands that we've included. So next slide. Good evening, everyone. So um, as Jen mentioned, I'll just quickly touch on a few points as well. Um, so one of the, the main things that's changing in this new official plan is that of our land use designations. Um, so the overall framework for our land use designations is changing a little bit. Uh, based on our engagement, we've heard a desire for things like more flexibility with mixed use, uh, higher design quality, better protection for things like heritage and public space. Uh, and our new urban and rural community systems are hoping to help us achieve those objectives. Uh, so, for example, we've combined our urban and suburban classifications um, so that we can focus more on creating complete communities and complete neighborhoods, regardless of their location in the county of Brant. Um, we want people, whether they live in Paris or they live in one of our smaller communities, to have access to all of the things that they need close to home. Um, and this helps us uh, kind of blend some designations and pr promote that mix of uses um, and helps us focus on creating the, these vibrant mixed use areas um, that people are asking us for. Uh, we're hoping to create as well a comprehensive design manual so that will kind of go hand in hand with our land use designations um, and it will provide guidance on things like how to design streets, um, complementary buildings to things like heritage or public space, um, and will direct development more so to our, our settlement areas. And speaking of settlement areas, um, we, uh, we've created more, a more comprehensive settlement area hierarchy. Uh, in our official plan as well as in the growth management strategy to clarify um, kind of how things fall and where growth will go. Um, and this is kind of a key factor in properly phasing our growth here in the county. Um, we, the province uses the term settlement area for things like cities, towns, villages, um, and it often differentiates between places that have full municipal servicing or places that have only half or, or no municipal servicing. So we wanted to make sure that that was very accurately reflected in this new official plan. So our primary settlement areas, um, places like Paris and St. George are, are the two of those. Um, and they're the ones where there is the municipal servicing that exists, um, where growth has historically been directed by the province um, and that policy framework. We have our second, secondary settlement areas. Um, so places like Burford, Canesville, Mount Pleasant and uh, Oak Hill Airport area. And these are the areas that have some servicing limitations. They might have partial servicing or private services. Um, some of them might be undergoing studies or other master plans to consider the possibility for servicing. Um, and those considerations are falling within the timeline, the 30 year horizon for this plan. And then finally, we have our rural hamlets and villages. Um, so those are our kind of remaining areas, our remaining residential areas, areas like Harley or say Newport, um, smaller communities that exist in the county of Brant. They're not really likely to receive um, municipal water and wastewater services within the 30 year horizon of the plan. But we wanted to make sure that they're acknowledged as complete, complete communities, just as um, Paris and St. George and the other ones listed as well. So outside of the three settlement types, uh, opportunities for severances, subdivisions, other types of larger development are gonna be strongly restricted. Um, and that's gonna be put in place to protect our farmland and our environmental features. It's also something we've heard a big thing about during um, engagement on this process. And it'll also help us focus on making sure that the development that does happen within our settlement areas um, is creating complete communities. So including things like parks and open space, 
uh, better roads, better traffic uh, infrastructure, sidewalks, trails, um, and things like better housing options for people uh, for affordable and attainable housing. So with that, um, I'll take over. Good evening, everyone. So a very integral um, component to this new official plan, as Brandon mentioned, um, is housing policies. And these go hand in hand with building healthy and complete communities. So the new official plan focuses on taking a more flexible approach to housing policies throughout the County of Brant by encouraging a range of housing options and tenures to meet all incomes, ages, and community needs as well as creating affordable housing through collaborative okay. approaches. Um, so this is with different private, community, non-for-profit and government groups. It also places an emphasis on housing to suit residents' uh, needs and good design and variations of compact built form, as opposed to focusing on um, very specific housing typologies. We found through implementation, especially through the zoning bylaw, um, that these can be quite limiting. So we've taken a very flexible approach through the housing policies in this particular document. Um, this, uh, this particular policy section, it also builds some strong linkages as well throughout the remainder of the document, um, specifically to sections like section eight, planning for infrastructure, and also um, section 11, which um, speaks to implementation in the county toolbox. So creating affordable housing or other housing options through developing unique tools that we can use throughout the years to really ensure that not only are we creating housing options to meet our community needs, but we're also um, reflecting all of the policies comprehensively throughout all developments that are undertaken throughout the county. Um, these policies also work to clarify um, the difference between attainable housing and affordable housing. These terms, again, they're often interchangeably used, but have very different and unique meanings and intentions. And so it's very important that uh, they're used appropriately and properly when we speak about development. And uh, lastly, these policies work to um, stress protection of existing ownership and rental stock, specifically with affordable housing throughout the County of Brant. This is extremely important, especially when we talk about building affordable housing stock throughout the County of Brant in the years to come. It's going to be very difficult to meet our, our targets, whether they be unique targets to the County of Brant specifically or targets developed with our joint service provider, the City of Brantford, if we don't um, also work on really protecting and preserving the existing um, affordable housing that we do have. Um, so that's the summary on the highlights of the housing policies, and I will pass it along now. Next slide. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Michelle Schaefel. Uh, one of the key changes in the draft official plan, it's in section six on protecting what we value. And as you've heard, we've really strengthened the policies in terms of what needs to be protected and how we need to grow. And the first, first category is on protecting the agricultural system. It's a large part of Brant County. Uh, it consists of our prime agriculture and our rural lands and, and the mapping has been updated to reflect uh, the distinction between those categories. And one of the key changes is really focusing on rural land uses and those uses that need to be in the countryside. So it's agricultural uses, related uses, on-farm diversified uses, and other uses which by their nature really can't be located in a settlement area such as mineral aggregate extraction or recreation and tourism. Uh, and then in terms of, I guess, non-agricultural uses or uses such as commercial, industrial, non-farm residential lots, uh, there is a big shift in the policy in that those uses will be directed to settlement areas as well as a rural hamlets and villages. Uh, one of the main purposes is to avoid further fragmentation of the agricultural system, to avoid land use conflicts such as minimum distance separation. And, and within those areas, we also do find a lot of our natural heritage features uh, or natural hazards as well. Uh, and going into that, so one of the big uh, tasks that we have undertaken as part of the draft official plan is 
extensive and detailed mapping of the county natural heritage system and natural hazards. While these features often overlap, they're not one and the same. Uh, so just distinguishing those and where are woodlands, where are wetlands, so people know that what the mapping is based on. Uh, so we've identified key features. We've also identified minimum vegetation protection zones as well as linkages between those systems to provide for a comprehensive natural heritage system. Uh, one of the big changes in the policies is going from the test of no negative impacts to no development. And that has already been done in the growth plan for the natural heritage system outside of settlement areas, but bringing that on a countywide approach uh, to set clear policies and directions so that we are protecting our natural heritage features. Uh, the county doesn't have a lot of woodlands left, so ensuring that those are protected. Uh, and, and building on the agriculture themes, just really limiting lot creation within the natural heritage features to ensure their protection, as well as natural hazards. And in terms of natural hazards, uh, I mean, the policies have directed growth away from those hazards, so continuing that direction, uh, as well as looking at updating the special policy area. Those policies were created in 1987, so modernizing those policies in terms of the current provincial policy statement, uh, which directs that it, they're really not meant for new or intensified development. Uh, if a municipality has other areas to develop, they're really to recognize historical uses, to allow for minor alterations and the continued viability of those uses, uh, just because they were built long before floodplain policies came into place. Uh, and in terms of the implementation, just looking at uh, and supporting complete, complete communities, uh, people love parks, they love recreational areas, so providing a public open space system for residents as well as visitors to enjoy. And lastly, uh, in terms of our cultural heritage and archeological policies, just providing enhanced policies, recognizing that many features are not necessarily identified and that further studies may be required uh, looking at an archeological management. Can someone plan. pass me a napkin please? Uh, to identify those resources. Uh, next slide. Uh, and we've heard about uh, the agricultural area is a large part of the economy and brand. Uh, it's, not in called, it's not called employment lands per se, but it certainly uh, contributes to the employment of the county and beyond uh, the jobs related to agriculture, the food industry alone, and the spinoff jobs alone is quite substantial. So it's very important to protect uh, the agriculture for the economy. We've also heard that it's part of our identity and we need to protect that rural character. Uh, so as I've alluded to, uh, so farming has been prioritized in the rural areas through protection, through preventing incompatible land uses and really emphasizing on the farming use, uh, providing flexible policies that allow for all kinds of agricultural uses, related uses on farm diversified uses, providing flexible policies framework for those uses. And in terms of supporting the agricultural system, they do, we do need an agri-food network to support the services that they need, such as infrastructure and servicing, uh, to help the agricultural economy succeed in the county. Uh, and in terms of within our existing settlement areas, there, there continues to be quite a substantial amount of farmland within our settlement area boundaries uh, that, that is not eligible for development due to servicing constraints. So recognizing those uses and providing for their protection through a prime agricultural holding uh, designation. Next slide, please. As Michelle said, um, agriculture was one of the big uh, topics with engagement during this project. Um, and another one of those big topics as well was infrastructure. Um, it's one of the ones we've heard the most about over the course of this project. Um, and we've gotten a lot of questions about traffic, uh, potential for a new bridge in Paris, about providing services to places like Burford and Canesville. Um, about adding a highway interchange at Bishopsgate and 403. So lots of big ticket items with infrastructure. Um, and the section of the draft official plan that's related to infrastructure, section eight, um, it can't lay out exactly what infrastructure projects are needed. 
um, that's just not the scope of an official plan. But what it can do is make sure that the growth that we see is only allowed to happen when certain infrastructure criteria are met. Um, so we're focusing a lot more on that as well. Uh, things like improving the traffic and parking in Paris, uh, making sure our communities have more trail connections, um, using the complete streets framework to make sure that parking, uh, design, speed, safety, all of those things have been addressed properly um, in subdivision design. And it's all things that we can make sure are being looked at as the county continues to grow. And as Jen mentioned earlier, the growth management strategy forms an integral part of our official plan. Um, it's tied directly to the availability of infrastructure and services um, and will help us control growth in that way. Um, we're also looking at working directly with, uh, we have been working directly with, with other county departments. Um, for example, operations is taking on their transportation master plan um, and plans like that will put some more detail to the, the policy framework that the official plan is providing. Um, so we're making sure that uh, those plans speak to each other well um, and that the needs of the residents are heard uh, specifically with infrastructure and development projects um, and the efficient phasing of development for Paris and St. George. With that, we've created a county uh, toolbox as Jen mentioned, so I'll hand it back to Jen and uh, she can finish up our presentation for us. I believe Michelle will present this slide. <laughs> Uh, yes, I will. Thanks, Jen. Uh, so the official plan is a very important tool in terms of establishing the vision for the county, how and where we want to grow, uh, and setting that overall vision, uh, broad policies, doing the mapping. But it's certainly not the only tool, and it can't succeed on our own. So as part of the official plan, we've created what we've called the county toolbox. So how are we going to get established this vision? Uh, so there are many tools uh, under the Planning Act, development applications such as subdivision, consent, site plan control. Under the Municipal Act, we've got the provision to have bylaws such as site alteration and tree conservation. And under the Ontario Heritage Act, it's really the key legislation to protect uh, heritage, cultural heritage in terms of designated individual properties, as well as concentrations through Heritage Conservation District. Uh, and then another tool is easy to think of development in terms of planning applications, but another major aspect of development is building permits. So even if we need to update our official plan, we need to ensure that the zoning bylaw is also updated. So for example, ensuring that the woodlands and the natural heritage system are zoned appropriately, uh, such that buildings are being permitted in those areas. So that is a key implementation tool and further expanding on the, the designations and the uses within the official plan. Uh, I think one of my favorite tools of all time has always been pre-consultation uh, since the early days of environmental planning. I feel like it's the most important tool to get out there early in the process before pen is put to paper, before money is spent on an application to identify what are the issues, what are the concerns, uh, how can we work together to make this development appropriate if there's areas that can't be developed, identifying those. And, and there's always more than one way to develop a property. So you might be able to identify, oh, heritage is a concern. Let's ensure that we've got compatible urban design. So I think that is one of the most important tools getting it there in front before a lot of money is spent on the development process. And it's a lot easier uh, to change things up front. And as part of that toolbox where you do have maybe more complex applications. One proposal is for a neighborhood meeting before you even have an application. So if you had a mineral aggregate application or an infill development, the proponent could host say a neighborhood night and just introduce it informally to the residents to receive feedback and adjust the proposal uh, to work with the neighborhood as well as the county and agencies. Uh, as I noted earlier, uh, I think a big component of complete communities and having a desirable community is public open spaces. Uh, so it, having parkland as well as natural areas. So whether it be through the development process or through acquisition, creating a connected open space system uh, for residents to enjoy. Uh, another tool that's not, it's been around, but it's not commonly used is the community planning permit system. And, and it's like a bylaw, but it's zoning bylaw, but it combines site plan, urban design, vegetation removal, uh, minor variances. 
So what it does, like the official plan, it looks at the vision and how are you meeting that vision? So instead of looking at rigid setbacks, like five meters and seven meters, you look at, is, it, is this development appropriate for the site? I've seen it used in downtown Brampton uh, to protect the heritage and outline a growth management strategy for how they will grow. So it's really flexible and it looks at urban design to create that quality vision. Uh, we've also heard a lot throughout this process about inclusionary zoning and the need for affordable housing. Uh, it, it is a complex tool. There's a lot of administration behind it. So staff are looking into that and being able to implement it in Brant County. There's a lot of other tools and just looking at easy tools to implement, such as uh, in the past year or so, the county updated zoning to allow additional residential units, including such as basement suites or coach houses. Uh, I lived in, when I was out in British Columbia, I lived in a new subdivision and every house was built with a basement suite. So the, the developer would convert it, uh, people would, use it for their family members, uh, they might have a nanny in there, or they might use it as income support. So maybe working with our developers just to make it easy to convert or to have a secondary dwelling in your house. So there's certainly a lot of tools that can be used to provide for affordable and attainable housing. And as I noted, I've, I've talked about heritage conservation districts and bylaws under the municipal act. So those are just a few tools that we can use. Thank you. So we'll just wrap up the presentation uh, by staff tonight. So literally what comes next, uh, what will happen after tonight? Um, as I mentioned, and so did Pam and staff, this is draft. Uh, it's out for review and we would like everyone's feedback um, as much as possible as we move forward to create a final official plan. Uh, if endorsed by council tonight, we will be submitting sometime in the next week or so to the uh, province. They've already given us a list of what they require for the draft for their one window review. As we've uh, talked about, we're doing online engagement, uh, ongoing engagement. Our public town hall September 5th already booked with our facilitator, Glenn. Uh, we're constantly engaging our Indigenous communities on their feedback. Um, and also looking at internal consultation with our departments to always make sure we're on the same page with the master servicing studies and the transportation master plan and other strategic initiatives. Um, we'll be looking into another phase for engagement summary uh, once we wrap up uh, in the late fall. Uh, we'll do our final growth management strategy, a honing of policies and coming up with a phasing of development plan that corresponds to master servicing studies. Our final municipal comprehensive review, as I said, it's still draft tonight. Um, and we're hoping the final official plan will come to you by January of 2020. Next slide. So just the pitch for the town hall that's already booked uh, September 15th. Uh, so we'll hope to see you there and everyone that's watching tonight. Um, and I'll wrap up. So thank you very much for listening tonight. And I understand if there is, I'll turn it over to Mayor Bailey, if there's any clarification, but I understand uh, there's quite a few delegations tonight to get to. Yeah. Uh, I think if it's okay with, first of all, thank you, uh, Jennifer, for all your work and, and Brandon and, and everyone. Uh, it's been a lot of work, as I said, and it, uh, it, it all makes sense, but uh, it was a lot to, to uh, read and to understand. So uh, forgive us if we don't sort of say, just do it. Uh, because we, we really do have some questions, but I don't think right now, I don't, if it's the will of council, I'd like to go to the delegations without qu questions right now for uh, OP, is that fine? Uh, Councillor Howes? You're okay. and Mr. Mr. Mayor, I, I, I did want to ask a question before we get to the delegations. Is that okay? Uh, no, that's fine if you want to do it that way. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, first, uh, thank you to Jen and everyone on the team for um, all the work on, on the documents and, and particularly on boiling down hundreds of pages of information into these digestible chunks. And you guys did a great, a great job on that. Um, the official plan is about so much more than residential growth, uh, but that is the critical topic for the residents at the moment. So I, I have a couple of comments and a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Um, the province has has clearly mandated that we grow from our current 40,000 people to a population of 59,000 people over a period of the next 30 years. 
it has been confirmed that we already have enough registered draft approved subdivisions to get us to that target. Therefore, I believe we were justified when we tapped the brakes on new applications two years ago, and we are justified now to not increase our settlement boundary. My, my questions are, um, first, am I correct in understanding that this also gives us justification to apply the excess land policy? And if you could explain how that, what that does for us. And then lastly, with 30 years worth of growth, residential growth already in the pipeline, can you please explain the mechanism by which we can control the phasing of this growth? Um, Watson and Associates already did the math for us in the Municipal Comprehensive Review. They stated that, that our, the, the growth we are required to, to attain by the province uh, works out to 250 units per year. We understand that, that demand is higher than that. Um, we understand that developers want to do more than that, faster than that. But, but it, I, I think residents in the community want to hear what tools are available to us to give them some confidence that they're not going to see the same explosive growth that they've seen in the last couple of years. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councillor House. Uh, Jennifer, do you want to try to answer that? All right, thank you, Mayor Bailey, uh, through Councillor House. So we can have, uh, it's, that's quite a, a meaty question. It may take a few minutes. Um, so actually, I'd like to call on Jamie Cook because he can actually answer, first of all, the residential land portion, uh, which you talked about. So the MCR identifies that we have a surplus of residential community area lands, uh, which is residential, as you mentioned. And then you asked, uh, are we justified to apply the excess lands policy because we have declared a surplus and how we came up with that. So if you don't mind, I'll, I'll get Jamie to jump in right here. And then we can also talk about how we control growth with our strategy and phasing of development. Thank you. Hi, Jamie. Good evening, uh, members of council and Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you for uh, this opportunity to be here tonight. Um, so I'll just start off by saying that uh, the math that uh, Councillor Howes went through is correct. You do have a uh, significant amount of development in the pipeline. It does over, um, it is it is over and above the amount of growth that we've identified in the urban areas of Paris and St. George to the 2051 horizon. So that is, all that math is, is correct. And I can direct you to specific pages and figures in the report if you want to get into those details now or later. Um, but that is correct. In terms of the excess lands policy, um, I think it is fair to say that it is a fairly um, new policy. You're going to be probably the first to apply it um, with, a, with the province. From my experience, um, working out there across, across the uh, Greater Golden Horseshoe, it, yeah, I think it's intentionally designed to, to allow flexibility for municipalities to determine how they want to use this policy, the, cl the clear direction that I get from the, from the province is they are using the policy to ensure that they don't exacerbate the surplus of, of uh, residential land within urban areas. So if there is a need to expand a boundary, you cannot expand that boundary before you identify excess lands somewhere else in your municipality. But there's nothing that also uh, prevents you from applying that uh, policy to identify excess lands that are beyond what's needed to, to, in the 2051 horizon, even in the event that you're not expanding your boundary. So that will be something I'm sure that will be um, discussed and interpreted, but that is my interpretation of how the, the policy can be applied. And um, so we're using that policy to essentially identify lands that we do not feel will be needed within the 2051 horizon based on our demand forecast. And um, that's been identified in the report. So I'll start Thanks, with sir. that response. And if, um, Jen, if you wanna maybe go into the next comment on phasing, um, I'll turn it back to you. All right, thanks, Jamie, and through the Mayor to Councillor House. Um, so some of the things, it's, it's a bit of a, a 
full topic in terms of phasing of development and growth management strategy. Section four of the new draft official plan lays out the strategy, which is not just one item. Um, it's everything from what we've talked about, our intensification targets being upped, our density uh, being upped in terms of the uh, designated greenfield areas. Um, it also is tied directly to servicing allocation um, in terms of ensuring the servicing is available before uh, things are uh, draft approved or registered within a three year horizon is one of the policies that we've laid out. Um, in terms of our community area land needs assessment and policies for the community structure, um, there's a bunch of things that we've done to lay out that uh, growth management strategy. And in terms of policies for intensification, also for the DGA lands in terms of growth, um, it does talk about timing and phasing. Uh, I've got the section up right here. Um, it's also really a lot about just keeping the settlement area boundary tight. Um, and then the biggest thing is also declaring the surplus and excess lands. It's one of the number one growth management tools that we've got. And then it's also uh, the timing, the timing windows as well. But all of this is corresponding to servicing allocation and infrastructure as well, which is found in the section under infrastructure. Um, so it's a two part and three part process, but um, as we move forward with our phasing of development and timing, I think more of the details will come out in the fall. So hope that's enough info for now. Thank, thank you uh, through, through you, Mr. Mayor. That, that does help and I, and I, um, it, I think people will be gratified to see that if, if there is not a firm plan for infrastructure to, to meet the, the added volume, that that, that volume won't happen. Um, that I, and I understand there's like a three year window. Um, I think that's gonna help. Um, but yeah, we, we look forward to uh, more details on the, on, on the phasing. Thank you. Are there, are there any other questions, Councillor Miller? Yeah, my, mine isn't quite as in-depth, Mr. Mayor, and uh, it's, it's just it's in regards to the presentations. That's why I want to ask it before. Um, okay. Also, um, if I could ask uh, through you to Jennifer to fix that typo in that last slide of yours, I think we're looking for a decision, a final decision, or final approval January 2022, not 2020. Um, and I know somebody's looking at this in the future. It could be a little confusing. So, um, but I just I was I was wondering, Mr. Mayor, if Jeffrey could just connect a couple dots for me tonight. Um, we're it, we're going to send this to the province uh, for a ninety day review. Apparently, they send it back. We still do public uh, consultations on it, public engagement, as you discussed uh, next meeting. I think you got one scheduled for September fifteenth, um, but. I don't understand, like, um, how much can we change it after the province has reviewed it for 90 days? Uh, what if uh, after tonight's presentations, we, we, you know, we suddenly we've changed uh, quite a bit. Are they going to need another 90 day review or, or will they be reviewing it after we've, we've changed it? Or are we just looking at tweaking it going from here forward? Uh, through the mayor to Councillor Miller, that's an excellent question. Thanks for asking it. Um, I can get Jamie to jump in in terms of the draft MCR if any changes are done at this point. Um, but we are expecting that there will probably be some obviously revisions. And as staff, I think I've talked to all of you throughout this week, uh, we will likely bring another report uh, probably sometime in October, uh, which will lay out a lot of site specific information, uh, any changes that are coming. Um, we can make changes and I think it's really up to the province um, that in terms of our review, but really it's almost like my, what Michelle talked about, about pre-consultation. What the province is receiving from us after tonight should be no surprise because we've given them already five reports previous to this. Um, but in terms of any changes, uh, you know, they, they could make changes. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of the MCR, I got Jamie to jump in, uh, but I think we have a pretty solid product um, but I guess that's the timing and we hope that moving forward that, you know, there won't be substantial changes, but, uh, that's why the timing's, uh, very important to us. So I don't know, Jamie, can you jump in about the MCR? Yeah, thanks, Jen. I think you covered it. Um, you know, we would expect that this is draft and there will be some changes. I can imagine that, you know, it's a massive report and if there wasn't one change, obviously I'd be quite surprised. So we will 
we'll review those comments and we will we will adjust and update accordingly. And I think that would be um, a, a typical experience that I would expect that we'll go through. So um, what I would hope is that we don't um, have any changes that fundamentally change the story of what we're doing. And, I, and as Jen said, I wouldn't expect that because of the way we've set the process up, the province has seen the, uh, the results already. So they would have likely already um, sort of clued us into a, a major concern they have at this point. So I, I would hope that the comments we're going to receive will be relatively minor in scale. Um, so we'll, I guess we'll, we'll wait and see. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I noticed both Jennifer and Jamie used the word hope in their responses. <laughs> and again, hope is not a good strategy. Um, so I guess my, my question, I'm going to get very specific on this one. They do a 90 day review, the province does. They send it back. We okay. Let's just say we tweak it. Do they need? Do we need to resubmit it for their final approval after that? Do we know? Sorry. Right. So you're talking no. about the interim between the draft getting comments back and the final. Yes. There could be a yes. an interim in there. Uh, if there is substantial changes that change the fundamental story, um, they could ask for another revision to the draft. Um, it does happen in municipalities, but the province is pretty succinct in their approach. I've been told they want to move this process forward, and I think that we'll work with them very closely to ensure that the timelines are met. And that's what I've been told by the province. So, Okay, thank you. Um, and you know why I'm asking, Jennifer. Um, to to yeah. me, some of these people have worked very hard on their site-specific requests. And, and if we turn them down, and I'm glad we, have, we can look at it again in October revisit because... Um, as I think most of the, the people that are involved know, uh, there is no appeal after we approve it for two years. So I, that's why I would really like to get it right on those site specific requests. So um, thank you for the answers. Thank you. Councillor Chambers, your next please. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, just in terms of process, uh, we have several delegations in the queue waiting to uh, present uh, and, and perhaps ask questions and clarifications. And I'm just wondering, uh, for the councillors who wish to ask questions, uh, is now the time you wish to uh, receive that? Or do you want, there's actually nothing on the agenda that allows uh, councillors to perhaps ask some in-depth policy questions and uh, clarifications, et cetera. So in terms of process, I see some of the councillors are jumping in now asking questions. Is, is it now that you want to do that and hold our delegations in abeyance or should we hear the delegations first and then uh, uh, go to the councillors who wish to uh, seek clarifications and perhaps suggest policy uh, suggestions. Uh, Councillor Chambers, that's a good, good point. That's sort of where I was going when we began. Um, I think that we should kidnap the delegations for the entire evening. Uh, that's what we're getting paid for to be here uh, for the entire evening. So I think with that being said, we won't have any more questions unless it's something we just can't live without hearing. And I don't think there's anything that important right now. So we'll go to the delegations if we could. Uh, 4.1, Dave Aston, here first, please. Remembering that you have 10 minutes to speak and the lovely Heather Boyd will come up and let you know when you have a, a minute left. And then we'll ask questions after that. And for those of you that aren't speaking, can I remind you please to have yourself muted so that we don't um, have any background uh, music and or events. Dave, are you here? Uh, good evening, Mayor Bailey, members of uh, council. I am here, I can't, I can't turn on my video yet. Uh, the, it says the host has stopped it. Um, Oh, maybe maybe we've heard you present before, Dave. <laughs> uh, oh, you're sharing your I, screen now. I can share my screen, um, and then uh, if if the host can put me on, that would be great. If not, uh, I'll just go ahead with my presentation, if that's okay. Yeah, we'll we'll try to get John, but you can okay. begin then. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks so much again for the opportunity to speak uh, this evening. I echo all of the comments as it relates to uh, the accolades to staff for bringing this forward and the amount of work and effort. And uh, also want to thank them for being willing to uh, be open to discussion. Um, I have just three points tonight. One is uh, on behalf of TCA. Uh, my presentation this evening, we support the Str strategic reserve employment lands overlay and the approach that's been taken there. And, uh, and we, we fully support, as I've mentioned in the past, uh, the county uh, making sure that there is employment land opportunity in the future uh, uh, for the county. Second point is we believe there needs to be further discussion on the, on the excess land mapping. Uh, that wasn't something that was shared or discussed with us. I believe the lands identified on Sharp Road uh, does need clarification. I say that because there is an existing plan of subdivision on file, has been on file with the county since 2013. And we've worked with county staff through the Paris Servicing Master Plan process for, you know, as that was ongoing. And in fact, in your approved capital forecast, uh, the Curtis Ave uh, sanitary sewer, which is required for these lands, are identified for 2025. So the lands are subject to an application. Consideration has been given to timing for servicing, and it's been approved in your capital forecast. So I believe we need some further discussion there. Um, and then the third is the conversion, uh, and that will be the key focus of my presentation this evening. Uh, this plan illustrates what's currently in the draft official plan uh, that's before you this evening. You can see the, the uh, lands we're requesting be converted in the blue. Um, and then actually you can see the Sharp Road excess lands are designated neighborhoods uh, just to um, the west. Few things I wanna point out when we're thinking about these lands. And, uh, and this slide, you'll see the hatched area, it's representing what would be left for employment as you start to apply some of the policy considerations. Number one is the natural heritage features mapping in the draft OP doesn't reflect the work that we've done on the ground to identify woodlots and wetlands. So the lands are more fragmented than what you are seeing in your draft official plan. When you look at compatibility with planned residential and you, you consider a 70 meter and a 300 meter setback, which relates to class one and two industrial facilities and class two industrial facilities really are anything that would have truck traffic or open storage. That 300 meter overlay you could see is essentially all of the lands uh, that are covered by the hatch. The Sharp Road extension, uh, continuing up into this area really isn't optimal. Uh, access is not as good as the 403 Rest Acres Road uh, area that you're, you've identified correctly as your strategic employment land area. And it would result in truck traffic into a residential area and really limited to no access to Dundas Street given the existing intersection constraints. Uh, the CN rail line also provides a setback uh, requirement, further fragmenting the land. One of the things that came up in the last meeting was talking about the historical designation. And these lands were previously designated back in the town of Paris official plan. And what I'd suggest is this area has changed a lot since then. The county uh, and, and others and agencies have turned the rail line that served the area into a trail. A great opportunity for the community, but no rail access for employment lands. Uh, the area is also changed with the commercial node on Dundas Street, uh, the investments associated with uh, the medical center and other retail and community amenity within the area. So this area has changed since it was historically designated as employment lands. Our conversion request, you could see uh, what we're asking for uh, to turn a portion of the, the blue area into yellow, along with making sure the natural features are appropriately identified. Um, the, there's a light 
green area, uh, the conversion would include the addition of a new park. And this park would be a transition between the uh, employment and the future residential area and the planned residential area at this point that would be connected directly to the trail. As you can see in this area, there is no park in this community. So we see this as a great opportunity to provide uh, that as an amenity uh, to the existing residents and future residents. Affordable housing, uh, I've had discussions with TCA and uh, TCA uh, is, is uh, willing to uh, provide an acre of land as a future affordable housing block uh, within the lands uh, to support affordable housing. And, and we can have further discussion with county staff in that regard, uh, should this move forward. But we believe that providing uh, a block of land uh, for discussion uh, for future investment is important. Uh, and, and that could be provided in this area. We believe that uh, the residential and the conversion would result in greater integ integration of lands within the community and really support this area developing as somewhat a, a, of a node or, or neighborhood uh, on the east side of Paris. And it will continue to maintain uh, 10 hectares of employment land at the, at the end of Sharp Road before that area starts to come into the planned residential. This just gives you a bit of an idea. At the last meeting, we talked about what would a development concept look like. As you can see here, the, the uh, lands proposed to be converted uh, just on this plan north. Um, and this is the area in which we could identify the block for affordable housing. And then lands to the south, that just gives a general indication of, of the current planned uh, collector road, local collector road, uh, within the plan of subdivision that's been submitted uh, to the county. So again, we believe that there's opportunity here to uh, build on uh, the planned residential area and the community. So tonight we're asking uh, council to provide direction to staff to identify the sharp road lands for conversion from employment land to neighborhoods and the small front portion community corridor to achieve the short and long-term objectives of the county official plan. And we understand that there's further discussion, further review to occur, but based on my understanding tonight is important for staff to receive direction to even consider further discussion as it relates to the potential conversion of the lands. And that's why we're just looking for that direction this evening. Uh, we're happy to work with, with staff in the future to uh, provide some more detail on what the land use designations might look like, what a site specific policy might look like to ensure the implementation of an affordable housing block and uh, provision for a new park. Uh, so that's my presentation this evening. Um, and I'd be happy to answer uh, any questions that you may have. Thank, thank you, Dave. Um, it, it, it was just um, not too long ago that we heard this presentation. So um, there was a lot of questions that night. Are there any other new questions for Dave regarding his, um, his request? There you are. Yeah, there we go. Better late <laughs> than never. Councillor House. Hi. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a clarification and I'm sorry for the phone ringing in the background um, yeah just a clarification uh, today uh, question for Dave uh, through you mr. Mayor. Um, so the conversion request that you are proposing I just want to clarify that the whatever number of units that entails would be in excess of the full pipeline that we already have that takes us to the targeted, the provincially targeted number of 59,000 people over the next 30 years. It's because your, your numbers, your conversion numbers are not in the pipeline calculation that we already are looking at, right? Just wanted to clarify. Uh, through Mayor Bailey, um, that would be my understanding. Staff could confirm, uh, but my understanding is that uh, 
the, any lands associated with conversion were not considered as part of the calculation. And I think that's been part of our challenge all along is that uh, uh, the request for conversion hasn't been factored into your calculations uh, associated with, uh, with the demand and uh, why we've been suggesting that uh, perhaps this is an opportunity for uh, intensification uh, as part of uh, the consideration. But I guess to, to be clear in my answer, my understanding is that any additional units would be in excess. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Dave? Seeing none, um, Dave, what we'll do now is we will um, give this to staff for consideration. And, uh, oh, Councillor Miller. Well, that's uh, that's uh, that's my question too. Um, are we moving to receive or do you need a motion on the floor to uh, move this consideration for conversion to to, to staff uh, to for to look well, at. I, I, I was I was thinking that all delegations tonight would be directed to staff for consideration. I don't know that we need a motion on all of them. Um, everything, everyone who's taken the time to speak to us tonight should staffs here, and they they've heard it, so they should uh, take it under consideration and get back to the delegations. I would think, but if you want to do it through a motion, that's fine with me, Councillor Miller. No, I didn't. I didn't know what the plan was because um, we were told during Jennifer's presentation that we would have a an opportunity in October to go over site specific requests, and I think at some point it would be up to staff to look at them and say, well, this would be a valid one for a, a site specific request for council to consider. So, <laughs> I guess I'll I'll play it any way you want, Mr. Mayor. If if you want to receive them all at the end and, and move them to staff for consideration, or I, or we could go one by one. I'll I'll, I'll let you decide, but. Uh, if, if you wanted one for this specific one, I would have, I, I would gladly move it. But All right, let's have, let, let's have you make a motion, Councillor Miller. Okay, well, I'll move that staff, uh, move forward with the consideration for conversion of the Sharp Road lands from employment to neighborhood and community corridor as per the presentation from MHBC. Seeking a seconder, Councillor Coleman. Any other discussion, Councillor Chambers? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the, the only problem I have with the uh, resolution is it precludes a, a, a general overall policy framework for converting uh, perhaps historically uh, converted uh, properties to uh, what I'll call more appropriate in, in this day uh, application. So I, I, I don't like, I would much sooner look at it from a higher level in terms of a a policy on converting employment lands and a justification if indeed it, it can be uh, through a policy to do just that rather than pick and choose individual requests. If we have an overall, develop an overall policy, that's the first step in looking at individual requests. So we're kind of putting the cart after the horse uh, uh, in, in this situation, and I think that's a mistake. Uh, if you wish to uh, uh, do them one by one, then, then you you're do that at, at the risk of not having an overall policy uh, for them all, because there are other areas in the county that were historically designated uh, in, in days gone by that have uh, perpetuated through the years that perhaps uh, looking at a, a clean slate would not be designated and the things that have changed have actually made the historical designations as, as David uh, Aspen has, has suggested, probably not uh, good planning. So that's my comment. And uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll support the, the recommendation uh, because uh, I think they all should be looked at, but in terms of the policy. Yeah. Councillor House? And just a quick process question, Mr. Mayor. Um, so if we vote, whether whether it's just this one or all of them as a, as a bundle, um, if, if we vote to support that they go to staff for consideration, does that mean that we support their, the, the applicant's request or does it just mean that we support that it goes to the process? No, we don't support the request. We just we just support the process. 
right, thank you. Councillor Bell? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Matt. Uh, again, a little bit on process, um, and maybe staff could, could give me clarity. My understanding is that, that none of this is new to staff. This has been part of their consideration as they've reached this point of a draft OP. And are we not just asking the staff to repeat work and slowing the process? And I, I, would, I would be against uh, making more work for staff when they're already pushed to deliver against the very tight deadline, having already done the work. Well, okay, Gen Jennifer, do you want to Thank say- Thank you, Mr. Malik, uh, yeah. Mayor, to, uh, through Councillor Bell, and I'll also get Jamie to jump in as well. So uh, this is Mr. Assen's third delegation to you. Um, he came on April 22nd, uh, June 10th, and tonight, and we thank him for that and taking the time to do this. Um, what's in the draft municipal comprehensive review in chapter seven talks about the employment land conversion requests, and we have recommended uh, not approving this one. It's part of the municipal comprehensive review. It's already been reviewed as a site specific request. Uh, employment land conversions were due on December 31st to the county to incorporate them in because it's part of the land needs assessment. And that's where we came to you in April to talk about employment lands. Uh, we've identified a shortfall of employment lands in the primary urban settlement area. And we recommend that we do not convert any of them in those areas. So this is now the third time that this has come to you uh, for review. Um, and also in terms of our preliminary policy directions on June 10th, we made the statement that we did not recommend uh, employment land conversions and then council gave staff direction to go ahead with that policy direction. So that's why we're here tonight, um, even though there are delegations who still don't agree with our approach. Uh, staff can receive and file, obviously, as we move forward, but that's where we've been and that's where we're here tonight. Um, but Jamie can jump in in terms of the MCR because it's part of our land needs assessment. Thanks, thanks, Jen. I just would add that we have looked at this, as Jen pointed out, very comprehensively. We've gone over and above the requirements of the province to look at this and uh, review and evaluate these conversion requests within the framework of the growth plan and the provincial policy statement and, and above and beyond that, we've developed our own site specific criteria to review these lands that have been are before you, uh, this one and the other conversion sites to ensure that we're not only looking at this from a broader land use perspective, but we're also looking at this with respect to a, a local lens that would look at market considerations, land use planning and other land economic considerations as well. And so through that analysis, we have, uh, made a recommendation in the report not to permit a conversion of these lands to a, a non-employment use. Uh, I am, um, I wonder if there's really anything more we could do at this point, if it was to come back to us at this time. Okay, thank, thank you, Jamie. I think, I think we can take it from here. Um, Councillor uh, Miller, do you wanna take back your motion or do you wanna have it stand with it seconded and it's ready to be voted on? Or do you want to just? I'm going to let, let it. I'm going to let it. I'm going to let it stand, and I will gladly speak to it when when uh, when you allow. All right. So, are there any other questions before we call the vote? I think yep. this will sort of. <laughs> okay, Councillor Miller. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I appreciate what staff says. Um, but the problem with Sharp Road is it's been a problem <laughs> for a long time. It's 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 wildly. Um, it's not a flat, easy uh, piece of property. There's a lot of natural features that make sense to kind of have more of a residential component to it. Um, and then there would be a buffer with a park. It, there, there's a lot There's a lot that makes sense. Um, I appreciate what Councillor um, Chambers said about having an overall Archie policy, but I, I thought that's what the, the official plan kind of was, and that's what we're doing. But sometimes you got to get it down to the nitty gritty and look at each one. And, and I thought that's why we're here tonight. And that's why I did ask that question before we started the delegations. Um, but having said that the sharp road lands, like I say, they've been looked at a long time there. It, it's a very, very difficult uh, terrain to work with. Everybody knows that. And um, I thought looking at this application, um, it made a lot of sense to me. And, and, and I, think, I think it would work very well. Um, for the town of Parish, for the county of Brant. And that's why I was happy to see it forward for what 
I was happy to see it come forward for one, but at the same time, I would certainly uh, support staff looking at it with the understanding that we would also, again, um, if staff decided to turn it down, we would also look at it again in October, which I understand we're having a meeting for site specific requests then. So that, that's, that's my spiel, thanks. It's a good spiel. Councilor Chambers and then Councilor Gatward. Yeah, j just to reiterate uh, my feeling on it, uh, nothing is precluding uh, an application uh, for an official plan amendment to, to come forward uh, at any time for that matter. And in order to uh, determine whether the application has merit, you need a strong policy in place uh, to judge it by. And that's my position. I believe that the policy uh, for conversion of employment lands uh, can be uh, uh, strengthened uh, and, and perhaps uh, take into consideration historically uh, designated parcels of land that in today's uh, time would not be designated ac according to the historical designation. So that's the policy that I need, I think we need to look at as a, a council and with a policy framework like that, we can uh, examine and adjudicate applications that come forward. But to uh, uh, refer the, this request, which is a kind of an application in disguise uh, for uh, uh, comments and, and direction, I, I think is, is not what I wanna do. So I'm not gonna support the, the, uh, the resolution, but I am not, uh, um, ruling out that I would not uh, not support an application if indeed uh, the correct policy, in my opinion, were in place. Thank you, Councillor Chambers. Councillor Gatward, then Councillor Ferrier, please. And then Councillor Bell. Thank you, um, Mayor Bailey. Well, I remember when we made this deal with TCA and um, the county had at one point a industrial plan of subdivision for the Sharp Road lands that um, was done by KMK, I believe, formerly, and they've been incorporated in with another firm now. And I thought it was a good plan. There was room for smaller industries and not everybody wants a huge industrial parcel. There's lots of um, entrepreneurs in the um, community and surrounding areas who may want a small industrial lot. And we brought the road up through there and it was understood when it was purchased, when it was designated. And so I'm, I don't support um, changing it to residential. I think it's appropriate the way it is. Thank it's you, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Councillor, I thought you were finished. That's okay. Uh, Councillor Leferrier and then Councillor Bell. Then we'll call the vote. Thank you, Mayor Bailey. Um, just, uh, I guess one comment and one clarification. Um, Councillor Chambers mentioned, uh, this is the clarification I'm seeking. He had mentioned that there's nothing stopping uh, an official plan amendment but my understanding is that if this is approved, I, I should say the, the OP is approved, there, there'll be two years where there won't be an official plan amendment um, application process. Like people can't ask for those changes for two years after whenever it's approved. Is that is that correct? Yes? I believe, okay. I be, I believe that is correct. So while, while there's nothing stopping it from coming back in two years, and maybe I'd be more comfortable with it then, I, I like the piece about, and this is where the comment comes in, I like the piece about the affordable housing, but unlike some other applicants who may come with some of that, that seems fairly new, and maybe two years from now it won't be, and there might be a little more meat on that bone to reconsider. But at this time, I, I feel like that, that part's new to this application today, as opposed to the other times we've heard this piece come. So, you know, it, it's, that's, we're fairly late in the process and and I don't again I don't see a ton of meat on that bone. It, like it, it was an interesting comment to make but there doesn't seem to be a lot of detail there so uh, yeah I'm, I'm in the same boat where you know I wouldn't approve it at this time but you know in the future with some more meat on that bone that almost idea of inclusionary 
uh, zoning uh, somebody is, t is doing on, on their own, uh, almost willingly, as opposed to being mandated. Uh, that's interesting. Um, but when this comes back in two or three years, maybe, maybe that part could be flushed out more. Um, but at this time, I, I, I can't support it uh, for the reasons stated by other councillors. Thank you, councillor. Councillor Bell? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I can't support the, uh, this application for a couple of reasons. One, we deem the lands to the west to be excess. Uh, we are short of employment lands, and I don't feel like giving away prime employment land. And over and above that, we've gone through an exercise in the MCR which addresses using a policy which we agreed at the last meeting as to how to assess these land conversions. And the conclusion was this one doesn't pass. So I don't think we're, I think asking staff to work this again is wasting time and we'll end up with the same result. So I will not support. Thank, thank you. And I think that's, um, I think that's all we need to say. Uh, the first delegation is always the hardest because it does form the way we're going to go down uh, the list of delegations. So with that being said, it's on the floor. It has a seconder. All those in favor of the motion? Councillor Miller, Councillor Coleman, all those opposed? It failed. Uh, a motion to receive, please. As information, Councillor Pierce and Councillor Howes, all those in favor to receive the delegation? Thank you, thank you, Dave. See you in two years. <laughs> we, we had an application a year ago, but I'll see you in two years. All right, thank you. 4.2.2. From Old Onondaga Road. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Can you hear me okay? We can. Okay, great. Um, I did send a presentation over to Ms. Boyd earlier. To, oh, and I see she's pulling it up right now. Yeah. Um, so my name is Dave Galbraith, and I am an associate and manager of planning with IBI Group based out of Waterloo. Um, and uh, like uh, we've heard already tonight, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, and congratulate the, the county on reaching this important milestone in, uh, in releasing their first draft of the official plan. Um, I'm here tonight on behalf of my clients, Mr. Andy Tulik and Rami Singh, who are owners of 112 and 114 Old Onondaga Road in the county of Brant. Um, this is our first time before council. Um, they were a little late uh, in the process, but uh, the, the process is still ongoing. Um, so earlier this year, we did submit a formal request for consideration to be given for the inclusion of their land within the Canesville settlement area and to be designated for employment purposes. Uh, next slide, please. So tonight I'd like to introduce council to the site and the nature of the requested boundary adjustment, as well as provide some high level land use planning rationale with respect to the request. Uh, next slide, please. So the subject property are, are municipally known as 112 and 114 Old Onondaga Road, um, which are shown on the screen highlighted in red. Um, they're immediately south of the existing Canesville urban area uh, and the combined area of the two properties is approximately 68 hectares. Um, both properties are currently farmed for cash crops uh, and a portion of the site uh, buffers the Fairchild Creek uh, and is uh, protected for environmental purposes. Um, as you'll see on the property configuration, a portion of the site, the actual access for both properties uh, is on the north side of the site, which is currently within the Canesville urban area uh, and designated for employment. Um, but then the, the majority of the property is uh, just outside of the boundary. So it's a unique configuration. The site itself is bound by the Fairchild, uh, Fairchild Creek to the north and the east and an active rail line to the south. In a sense, these sites are, are kind of like a peninsula in that they're, they're cut off from uh, the surrounding agricultural area on the, the other side of the rail line um, and just south of the employment area. Next slide, please. So the site is immediately adjacent to an existing employment area to the north, which includes Bell City Auto Center, A1 Recyclers, a lumber yard, and a repair shop. A couple of these uh, businesses do benefit from the rail line, uh, including the, the, the lumber yard, which actually has a uh, spur go into the setting. Uh, Canesville uh, and the site uh, included is located east of the city of Brantford, as you know, and very, uh, in very close proximity to Colburn Street and approximately four kilometers south of the 403. Next slide, please. This slide shows the in effect municipal planning controls which apply to the property. 
Uh, as you can see on the left, that's the uh, existing official plan designations, which uh, the blue area includes the access to the property. Uh, and then the remainder of the site is white and green, which are natural heritage uh, and agricultural. Uh, and then the corresponding zoning uh, is for agricultural and natural heritage purposes. Um, with the exception of the areas, including uh, an abutting Fairchild Creek, um, all of the site is zoned for agricultural purposes. Next slide, please. So one of the many considerations, as, as you are aware, that council must cons uh, consider in its review of uh, expansion requests is the agricultural capacity of the site. Um, this, this slide shows the soil makeup of the property, um, which is largely rural soils or non-prime, um, made up primarily of class four so soils. Next slide, please. Um, as detailed previously, my client has submitted a request to have their lands included within the settlement area of Canesville uh, and be designated for employment purposes. Uh, we have reviewed the initial draft before council tonight and note that these requests have not been supported to date. Um, and we kindly request that consideration uh, to these requests be considered in the future. Next slide, please. Um, as part of our report that was submitted earlier this year, um, uh, various pieces of land use planning rationale were laid out, um, as you will see on the screen. So first, uh, the site is adjacent to a settlement area uh, and represents the logical expansion of Canesville. Uh, it's also adjacent to an existing employment area and again would be a, the logical next step in this location. Um, from a transportation perspective, the site has access to uh, some major corridors as well as the rail line, which would support freight sensitive or freight intensive uses from the site. In addition, uh, it's noted that uh, the current direction of the OP focuses employment growth mainly to the north areas of the municipality in Paris and St. George. Um, and while it is warranted uh, and, and indeed required in these areas, um, council should also consider whether um, to support additional employment lands in the more southern areas of the municipality. Um, so at this time, I'd like to thank council for the opportunity again, uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to come and speak to us tonight. Are there any questions of the presenter? Seeing none, I'll ask for what are we going to do? Or can I get a motion, Councillor Pierce? Move to receive, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Looking for a seconder to receive the delegation. Councillor Coleman, are there any of the comments, concerns? Councillor Bell? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just a, a process question. In the la with the last delegation, we made a pretty definitive decision not to accept the, the application. Uh, are we changing our course of, of processing these uh, land conversion requests? Uh, we, we didn't direct it back to staff, Councillor Bell. We just received it. I mean, we have it in front of us. It's a, it's a report. I think we need to receive it. We've seen it. So to see it is to receive it. Councillor Bell? Yeah, you're okay. Councillor Gatward? Yes, I think this one is dealt with in the MCR. Thank you, Councillor Gatward. Any other comments? Call the vote to receive. Any, anyone opposed to receiving it? No, oh, passed. Thank you. Thank you for your time, sir. Thank you. Thank you. 4.2.3, it's Henry Stolt, please. Oh, Douglas. Yes, and also, <laughs> Henry will also be a part of this. I'm, I'm here with him to speak. All right. Uh, we are here to speak about the proposed official plan and we appreciate this chance. This is our first time before council. Uh, we have reviewed the official plan and appreciate all the effort that staff have prepared. We have participated in the process outside of being before council. So we're going to continue to participate and be engaged with staff. When we were at we'll watch the last meeting, we were very ex excited that staff had said 
they were going to modernize the policies of the downtown core special policy area. We support that principle of that they do need to be modernized to reflect the situation of today. The SBA, the special policy area, was created in 1987. What I want to point out is since that time, we've had several versions of the Planning Act. The Provincial Growth Plan came into force and effect in 2006 and has been amended several times. We're now working on several versions of the Provincial Policy Statement. Policy, the public policy has changed. Even the county has amended its official plan several times and their comprehensive bylaw. What's consistent in that policy changes is that focusing in urban cores, mixed residential with commercial. After all, the urban core is the heart of the city. We support to ensure that any development existing and proposed is protected from hazards, but there's a variety of different ways for that to be achieved. For residential, it should and must be above the regulatory flood line. The building should be flood proof. You should reduce the building footprint in the hazard and restrict anything below that regulatory flood line. Well, my excitement ended with this version of the plan. However, it's not too late for council to put its stamp on the plan and support the vitality of the urban core and the momentum that has been recently occurring with other developments within the special policy area. In, in my professional opinion, as a professional planner, successful urban cores are achieved when public policy supports private entre entrepreneurs <laughs> supports private entrepreneurship and investment and primarily those cores where residential is permitted all across Ontario where I practice if you see a vital and a vibrant urban core it's most likely because council has taken the initiative to create a public policy framework of supporting residential. I can name many urban centers which were declining and being abandoned until res residential being permitted resurrected the core and made it the heart of the city. Council has that opportunity through this plan. Henry will speak, and I thank you for this opportunity to speak to you as a planner. I now turn it over to Henry. Thanks, Douglas. Good evening, Good evening uh, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Thank you, Douglas. Um, this is, uh, as Douglas referred to earlier, a bit disappointing when we saw the uh, new implications with respect to downtown. Um, as far as we see it, there is an exist existing approved downtown master plan. There's an approved downtown Paris design guidelines. There are, is an approved official plan, which supersedes the SPA policy of 1987. We've gone through a number of pre-consultations with staff 
up to this point on a project which we had planned to do. Um, there's also in place, which was talked about earlier in some of the presentations, infrastructure in the downtown with respect to services and uh, parks and trails and an overall community, which would be a benefit to more residential. The other component, which is different today than 1987 is the warning and forecasting systems in place are much improved. Emergency measures are in place with the county and the fire department. There's a flood mitigation plan underway for downtown Paris and new residential construction will be flood proofed and will be able to deal with flooding much better than buildings built 150 years ago. Today's downtown is healthy and it's no, no small part because of the Royal and some other investments in Paris. Allowing more residential units, encouraging retail and commercial space at the ground level while in addressing the flood requirements for residential supports the vitality and enhance the downtown core. No growth in the long term means negative growth. And Douglas referred to this already. The Grand River and Nith River are wonderful assets which contributed positively to the downtown Paris lifestyle. Our request is to have intensification and indents and additional residential units through renovation and redevelopment in order to maintain and encourage the vitality of downtown. People and walkability make for a vital community. Growth, which is in keeping with the character of the downtown and meets the visions of both the master plan, the official plan and the uh, Paris design guidelines which envision four story buildings of which there's not many today, therefore envisioning growth. GRCA in the presentations we've made with respect to the condominium project, which we've had proposed and I'll refer to that later, we could meet all of the technical requirements with, resp with respect to flood plain and flood issues. The one issue which made it difficult is the number of units. A number of units need to be increased in order to make projects viable. Through our discussions, it's become clear that GRCA are requesting direction from the county in order to proceed with additional units. It's not that they don't want them, but they're looking for some rationale from the county as opposed to us. I've presented my presentation to the local landowners and have support from Walter Kopelar of the Walters Group, uh, Bill Kennedy and, Bill, and Matt Cummins, who suggest not unlimited growth, but limited growth with respect to taking to account the characteristics of the municipality of downtown. Bill Tuff, John Grantham, Aaron Dunham of the Arlington, and Larry Pickering, the major landowners of downtown. And they're all supporting additional units through intensification. I'll read you excerpts, an excerpt from the existing OP. The construction of new residential dwelling units above existing commercial uses and the conversion of existing commercial buildings to residential use shall be permitted conditional on the dwelling unit being located at a minimum elevation equal to the regulatory flood level. Similarly, uh, there's another clause which refers to the redevelopment and intensification. The new OP basically says there will be no residential intensification, none. It also refers to no spaces being allowed in basements, no, no basements being built. If you're going to build a flood wall, why would you not incorporate the basements at the same time? So I think the county are missing an opportunity to work with the landowners, GRCA, and new technologies to deal with flood mitigation and encourage the downtown development of downtown Paris. Many of you know that Northern Rudder Holdings Inc. owns uh, several buildings in downtown Paris in the, in the core. We own one to 13 Red River Street North. 
Um, our proposal was at one point to go th with, through with a uh, condominium project. And we had met several times with the Heritage Committee and most latterly with Steve Howes, Steve Pinkett and David Powell and come up with a plan which was acceptable to the committee. Our plan was based on additional units over above what was historically permitted. At this point, we're not going to proceed with it as it's too much of a risk and too much of a diversions. And at this stage in my life, I don't really want either one of them. What we are going to request is that what we will be doing is our intentions to redevelop each individual property, retaining the existing street front elevation where possible and follow the design guidelines approved by the county. Improving all aspects of the buildings with new HVAC, electrical, plumbing, and improved visibility and exposure to the rivers, as well as flood proofing. That's our proposal. So it's an enhancement of what's there today, as opposed to some of the buildings we have. In doing so, we're looking for probably an additional five to seven units over all of the properties. We will be applying for a demolition permit for five and seven Grand River Street by October the 15th. In our commercial space, which we've just leased, there's a new art gallery at 13 Grand River and at 11 Grand River, a new, there will be a new restaurant, which we've agreed to a five year lease. Mayor Billy, we're, we're coming, we're coming close to the 10 minute mark. Thanks Heather. Um, I just have one other comment. I've been members of this community for the last 14 years and our family has been a member of this community for a long, long time. We're local residents and we think the downtown needs to be vital in all aspects of it, which includes paying attention to the criterion that is there and within the guidelines for growth and allowing a intensification for residential growth. There's easier ways to making money than what we're proposing, but we think contributing positively to the overall well-being of our community will stand us all in good stead in the long term. So thank you for receiving our delegation. Um, we're looking for amendments to the current official plan, proposed official plan, and for council to inform GRCA they're looking for more intensification downtown. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Henry. Um, what does council want to do with the delegation? Do you have any questions for Henry? Andrew uh, Douglas. Or Andrew Douglas. Um, Councillor Wheat, you have a question? No, I don't have a question, but I'm prepared to make a motion. Okay, I'm looking for questions first, Councillor Wheat. Councillor Howes? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to uh, Henry and Mr. And Douglas. Um, it, Henry, I, 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 we did appreciate the fact that when you were, when you're looking at your broader project, that you were allowing input on the heritage characteristics and, and, and in, input on, on design of, of your plan to, um, to, to make it fit in better with our lovely downtown. And, and I, I really did appreciate the, the fact that you were open to input on that. Um, but I do understand from your, your presentation tonight that that plan has changed because, because that plan, I, I believe you were, you were kind of stuck with the same number of residential units that, that you have now. Um, but just one point of clarification, you were talking about, uh, you know, you're looking at uh, doing a demolition of one of your units uh, this October. You are able to proceed with that without any amendment, correct? We're looking to demolish uh, five and seven, which is a taxi place and um, uh, cavalcade on the ground floor and then proceed with the development with an, a development application for two additional units above, above what's there today. So it would be four residential units, two facing the street as studio units and two facing the back river and a, a larger commercial space than what's there today. So um, by not allowing intensification of that plan, it certainly makes the viability of that process much more difficult. And um, uh, so that's where, that's where we are today. 
And the, one follow up, Mr. Mayor. Terry. And the increasing the number of, so increasing the number of units, uh, residential units in that space, just that space would, would require an amendment as, as you've outlined. Um, and I just wanted to clarify uh, for anybody who's, who's watching, um, the, the, the plans that you would have for that lot uh, do not include parking, correct? Correct. Thank you. There's no parking, there's no parking requirement as far as the zoning bylaw is concerned. Uh, and the official plan today allows for four story buildings. We now have a two story. If it allows for four story, it envisions more growth. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bell, your next please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, I'm supportive of what Henry is suggesting here for a couple of reasons. Uh, I want to see downtown, our downtown Paris thrive and stay alive. And if we look back at what we've done in the last year or two as a council, we've been encouraging additional residential units all over, all over the county. And this is just, if you like, a particular application of additional residential units. But my question to Henry is what will happen to these properties if we don't approve what you're suggesting? I don't know. Uh, the five and seven certainly are not very, uh, they will not be improved the way they are today. Uh, they need to be demolished and they're in very rough physical shape. Uh, we've spent a fair bit of money over the number of years keeping them the way they are and it, it, it doesn't make sense to keep doing what we're doing. So uh, we, need to, we need to proceed through uh, at least demolish them and then decide what to do after that. Thank you. Are there any other, uh, Councillor Miller and then Councillor Gottward, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, three to Henry and Douglas. Um, is it, is it, is it, is it, the sorry, I, I'm, I'm not clear on why you can't proceed. Is it the heritage or is it the, is it the, the flood, the flood plain, the flood issue? Or is it both? Um, Douglas can probably clarify, but right now, it refers into the proposed official plan as no intense, no residential intensification uh, through redevelopment or renovation. And it's, so we could do some minor renovations and keep the existing units. That certainly is not viable where those two projects, those two addresses are. Douglas, do you So no residential that? intensification in the downtown Paris area, right? Correct. Mr. Mayor, maybe we could ask staff why there's no residential intensification in the downtown Paris area. I just, I want to, I'm just trying to clarify why that is. Jennifer, why is that? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through Councillor Miller. I'm going to get Michelle to answer. We were actually in discussions with the province about the special policy area floodplain. Uh, we're taking direction on the, pro on the province on this. We had a meeting a week and a half ago with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, along with MMAH London about our special policy area. Uh, Michelle can elaborate on those discussions about what's going on and the changes that were in our plan. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, so I, I would like to elaborate a little bit, provide some background. Uh, when you're dealing with natural hazards, uh, there's no shortage of policies and, and technicalities involved. And I think at the end of the day, we do have to remember we've got the NIF coming into the Grand River. This is a hazardous area. And while it's easy on a beautiful day to forget that this area could flood, the reality is there. And the intent is to protect life and property, to pre prevent social disruption, as well as to protect the financial well being of the municipality, as well as the province, for when a flood does happen, if uh, lives are at stake, buildings are damaged. And this is actually, it's got very prospective policies in the provincial policy statement. And any special policy area, if any changes to the policies are proposed, any changes to the land use designation, uh, any changes to the boundaries, this has to be approved by both the Municipal Affairs and Housing, as well as the Ministry of Natural Resources. It's actually quite a technical process. There's a whole technical guideline to go through requiring engineering studies, uh, if you do go through the detailed process, it's probably about four to five years. It's quite costly. So if you do want to allow intensification, there is a prospective process. 
Uh, and, and there's no guarantee that the province would improve intensification because uh, these areas, they are flood prone, the intent is to direct development outside of them, allow for minor modifications. Uh, however, these policies do allow you to do some minor tweaks uh, through the official plan update, but in terms of intensification, uh, I think it would, based on discussions with GRCA, with the province, with MNR, I, I think that is difficult to uh, support. Uh, we are looking at, and I should clarify, in the flats, we would be continuing to allow some residential intensification as well as commercial because it is less risk in that area. But within the downtown core, and I must say it's only the area south of William Street, so it's not a large area, uh, staff are still proposing to allow some minor intensification in terms of commercial uses. So this is in line with the original 1987 policies intended to promote commercial and employment uses, uh, commercial in the downtown core. Uh, so that's basically what we are looking to do. I, I think, uh, the municipality could propose intensification. I'm trying to find the right balance with the province and what they will support through the official plan process. Uh, so that's a little bit of the background. I'm certainly happy to answer any more questions in regards of what's proposed. If I may yeah, just also follow. answer. Uh, okay. So if you look at the existing policy framework, if there is residential there today, you can continue that residential. You can improve the commercial building and the residential building portion of it. So there already is a permission. The question is, if you have X square feet of residential and it's efficient to create, if you have one space and for good planning reasons, you wish to create a second within the same space, which the policy would acknowledge isn't permitted because staff are suggesting that that's intensification. So all, so our concern is the policy frameworks, as I understand it, supports the continued operation of both the commercial business or what business it is, as well as the residential. You staff are suggesting you only run afoul of the policy if you propose an additional residential unit than existed there historically. And that's the concern we have because the space may make sense to have two but staff are suggesting that two is not acceptable under the policy. The policy in the plan today as it's approved would, uh, my opinion would be, would support that as long as you meet the requirements of reducing the footprint in the hazard, flood proofing and having the residences above the regulatory flood line. So, so we have to be careful because the policy framework today supports the continued or improvement of what's there today. And the debate is you have a core and you're restricting it to what's only there historically. Thank you. I wanna hear Councillor Miller's follow-up first, followed by Councillor Gatward and then Councillor House. Yeah, I appreciate that, Mr. Mayor. Um, and before I get dropped off the Zoom call here again, um, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just wondering like, okay, so, <laughs> But my, my first, my, my only question really was: was this uh, those prohibitions in because of uh, uh, the flood flood issues, or was it, it was it heritage? And, uh, and my understanding is a special policy area because there's natural hazards. Got that? Thank you. My question is: why are we shutting down everything if we have a flood mitigation strategy stud, study going on that we've not heard back from? And I'm just wondering if if there wouldn't be something in there that would allow us to to do a bit of intensification and, and nobody, I don't think anybody wants, you know, 40 million people in downtown Paris, but, but I think there could be some intensification if, if this flood mitigation strategy, um, well, if, if it could come out with some, some good ideas. Um, I think Henry alluded to that earlier. We're, we're, we're certainly further ahead than we were a hundred years ago. We, we know, uh, we know how to build better and things like that. So I guess that's my question. Um, are we not going to, we're not going to take into consideration this uh, 
that flood mitigation strategy that we're working on before we shut everything down for the downtown Paris. Councilor Gatwood, before we hear you, Michael's popped on for a minute. I think you must have something to say. Mr. Bradley. Your Worship, sir, I'm having a screen problems here. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't mind just maybe if you wanted to con conclude questions and then if you, if council wants to talk about what to do with the request, uh, I have some feedback for council, so. All right, then we'll go to Councilor Gatwood and then to Councilor House and then Councilor Pierce, I believe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, it was said earlier that there could be up to four stories and four stories would lead to more residential units than what's the two that are existing now over number five and number seven. So I don't understand what the problem is. I mean, who would want to have a four-story building in this location? It wouldn't fit in with the heritage and the, the look of the downtown. But here we have a developer who wants to maintain the facade of the building and improve it, make two studios above front facing and two apartments facing the river within the same footprint. To me, that is much better than a four story where you could fit more units. And so it doesn't make sense. And, and I don't consider two units where one was to be really intensification. Right now we're allowing extra units within homes and little, um, little houses on second lots and the province wants intensification and it's going to be above the flood line. So I, I don't know if I agree that two additional units is really, I mean, if it was six additional units then I'd say yes, going from two to six is, but that's just my comment, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Councillor Gatward. Councillor, how is your next, please? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, um, uh, a long question for Michelle and a short question for Henry. Michelle, okay. the, I, I'm still stuck on this kind of chicken and egg situation. Are, do, does our does our policy inform the, the ministry and the GRCA's policies, or do their policies kind of determine what our policies are. I'm, I'm still not clear on that. And then my quick question for Henry is, is, is <clears throat> if you're, if you're, if you're, if we're understand that you're going from two residential units above the stores to four residential units above the stores, are you looking at a, at a, either a two or three story building and not a four story building? Just to clarify. Thank you. Henry first. Henry first. Um, dealing with the, just to be clear, what we're looking for at five and seven is an additional two units and a three-story building similar to what's downtown Paris today. Um, and if you take a look at it, it's a little, uh, it's a little building which has, I try to think of, uh, an A-frame type construction as opposed to everything else. Um, we're improving number, the facade of number one, which used to be the Green Max with new signage and a thank you for that. Our intention also is to improve them to such an extent and have them as rentals that'll be there for a long time. And so uh, if I take a look at those buildings today, they're much more of a hazard as they are today for life and limb than they would be <coughs> once we actually fix them up. Um, and overall between one to 13, we're probably looking for an additional five units, including where we are now in our new office and have, uh, where you, there used to be two resident, residential units and increase that by another two units and go up to another third floor. So that's sort of what we're looking for in downtown Paris. Thanks. But it's, not a lot. it's not a lot, but it's that sort of space. But um, this, excuse me, this, Henry, this current 
amendment discussion is specific to two addresses. This, no, the current amendment discussions are spe specific to one to 13. Oh, I see. So right. it deals, it's an overall policy for the downtown. It's not just for me. I see. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mich Mich oh, Michael? Yeah, through you, Your Worship, and maybe I could just before Michelle, uh, we dragged Michelle into a, a lot of technical um, complications. So I, I would support council referring this matter to staff and asking us to do further analysis on this. It's been a pretty busy week here for us. And I've, uh, I chatted with Henry earlier this week. I've also chatted with staff. And I, I've heard the, the special policy area argument going on here for a number of years. And what I do know is that there's conflicting information out there from the province uh, from the GRCA, from the perceptions of the planning community. And I think we've got some further work to do on this and potentially uh, some, there may be some middle ground on this. So uh, I would I would support, and I just uh, I was just uh, chatting with the, uh, the general manager, we would support having this preferred back to staff uh, and uh, with with some, just, just an expectation that we will further analyze this. I think further uh, conversations with the province and the GRCA need to take place. And then when we bring our, uh, our feedback report to council in October, we may be able to provide some clarification on this and maybe an, an, an elegant solution because there's more than one landowner in the, uh, in the special policy area that's, that's, that, that has interests. And I've had conversations with, with all of them. And uh, I think we should, uh, we should continue to chase this very elusive uh, uh, story down. So that's, that's my comments, Ms. Uh, your worship. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you know what? Thank you for that, Michael. It makes everything much more clear. Councillor Pierce, you're next, then Councillor Coleman, or Councillor Laferia, and then Councillor Coleman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you, and, and thank you for Michael to uh, to popping in and suggesting that, because this is very confusing, and I'm I'm kind of torn like Councillor Howes, I believe, there, in the sense that if I understood Michelle correctly, even if we wanted to allow this, which I, I think what Henry's doing here is great, if we want to allow this, we might not be able to as per the province, but that, that's never really been set clear for me. So I'd be more than willing to make that motion to send this back to staff for further information because I don't think I'm the only one that's a little confused here on, on all the, the ins and outs of what's actually going on here. And from what I'm hearing, uh, the ins and outs, you know, maybe may be changing or may have changed as far as the province is concerned. So I don't think we can make a, a, a sound decision here until we have all that information. That's right. Thank you, Councillor Pierce. Before we put the motion, though, Councillor Weed is before you for the motion. Uh, Councillor LaFerriere and then Councillor Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's just a quick one to, to Michael and, and I guess staff. Um, just hoping that when that piece comes back from, from staff, if we can have a piece in there about how this compares to the uh, additional residential units and also what would our power be in any recommendation to limit things? Because while I really like uh, Henry's proposal, I, I also don't want to see you know eight-story condos in the downtown and 60 units. And, and while I don't think Henry's going to do that, um, I think that there's a potential others could so what what can we do to limit based on you know stories uh, limitations which I know we have and parking and because I know with those additional residential units parking plays a factor and that's not the case in the downtown with the current unit setup so you know finding those ways that we can limit and utilize discretion um, I think would be really helpful for us to make a, a good decision that's all thank you Councillor Coleman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and Councillor Pierce stole most of my thunder on this one, so I, I fully support what he said, and, and I, I think we need to move on this after uh, seeing the CAO because we could debate this for the next hour, so thank you, Mr. Mayor. Now, thank you. I'm, if there's no other questions, I, I, I'm going to go back to Councillor Wheat and see what he was thinking. Well, I, I like to make a motion seeking a seconder that this application be referred back to staff for further examination. And I think there's support there, especially from our CAO. I really like to support things that are happening in our downtown area. And when you have someone who's willing to spend five cents to improve the appearance of the downtown and maybe bring people in, and bear in mind if they're living there, they're not contributing to urban sprawl. <laughs> so I will be making a motion seeking a seconder that this be referred back to our staff for a further review of this application. Thank you, Councillor. We, uh, Councillor Pierce is your obvious seconder. That's fine. Uh, I, I would think uh, Councillor Chambers wants to speak to it before we call the vote. Yeah, just to be clear, uh, we're not referring what's been referred to in, as an application. This is to refer 
the matter back to uh, uh, staff in terms of policy uh, framework. Mm -hmm. So the staff is going to look at the policy as opposed to trying to either approve or not approve the what has been called an application. Am I correct on that? I, I think that is what Michael is saying. Staff wants to review the policy independent of what uh, uh, Henry is uh, proposing to do. That's what I think I heard, but we'll let that, Michael that's say. Correct. Right there. Yeah. That's correct. That's what my motion includes. Michael? Yeah, and through you, Mr. Chair, uh, Your Worship, yeah, our, our intent would be to, I think the questions that have been brought forward are concerned with the uh, with the with the this special policy area in downtown Paris policy, and we would be reviewing that, and we can have further dialogue with Mr. Stolp and his and his team on this. So, thank you, Michael. Uh, if there's no other questions, we have a motion on the floor by Councillor Wheat, seconded by Councillor Pierce. All those in favor? Anyone opposed? Thank you, Henry. Uh, thank you, Douglas. Thank you. And uh, we'll move on. Oh, we'll, uh, we'll move on a little bit. Now we have Bob Stewart. Uh, hello, Mr. Stewart. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. I'm uh, going to pass this over to Douglas for the presentation and I'll speak after. Thanks. Okay. So it's well, still well, Stewart and Stewart. Still Stewart. Well, Stewart. Well, welcome back, Douglas. <laughs> Thank you. I believe staff will put up our presentation. Thank you. If, if I may begin to members of council, staff and the public, our presentation today is to you and our theme today, our theme we wanna convey and why we're asking for what we're asking is about the term partnership. If I could have the next slide, please. So I think what partnership also does is build on what occurred from the past. So how did we get here and what does it truly mean? I, I, I would like you to put yourself in the position of somebody buying a home around this piece of property. What would they have done? Well, they would probably have spoken with staff they probably would have looked at what the official plan says. Were there any studies? What would their what would the, the, the zone owning state? What they would have done as part of their purchase strategy is taken all that information into account. So what does the approved official plan provide for? Well, they would have seen that the current official plan, the approved version, does designate the property as employment. And the bylaw reflects what the official plan provides for. However, they would have also looked at what does the Northwest Area Study provide for? Because that's an important piece as well. It takes that official plan that does contemplate these special studies. So what would it convey? What they would have seen is there's an, a proposed expansion to an existing park. They would have seen that there was residential from a mixed perspective, might include street townhouses, might include a medium density block and some office and employment. What this study also did in 2012 was provide the justification for that conversion and it was approved. So how come the, the land conversion didn't complete? The parcel of land was owned by the county. If we could move to the next slide, please. When you look at the Northwest Paris area study, this parcel of land, it's the center. In some perspectives, if we were to deal with a franchise, it's the hole in the donut. What's surrounding it is residential. And in fact, it's the heart of that. What's being proposed, and this is the same concept you would have seen at our previous presentations is, 
exactly detached housing and townhouses facing an existing street, townhouses internal, um, two mixed use buildings that will have ground floor commercial and office and residential above. Not sure the tenure at this point, but what's also key and is what we've talked about since the start, there would be an affordable housing apartment block if we can move to the next slide. So what does this partnership with the county mean? What happens is the plan would require to provide 5%. 0.22 hectares. What does that do? It adds to an existing neighborhood park, a park that isn't built today. It will improve the functionality of that park and the county can now provide a program for that park. What does it also do? And it's an important function of all the public planning policies. It's efficient use of existing municipal infrastructure. There's a stormwater management pond that's been designed to provide for this. There is existing infrastructure in Woodsley, Woodsley Avenue that will service this. The other part of it is there's no additional commitment to the county to provide a brand new street. Next slide. Partnership. What does it mean to the neighborhood? Adds to the park. We've talked about that. Importantly, when you go back to its location, it completes it. All the lands to the north side of Woodsley are planned, and this would con contribute to that. What does it also do? It gives them additional services. As we indicated, there are two proposed buildings that could have, and we're working towards potential a care personal services, maybe a takeout restaurant, an office, but importantly, people may be able to occupy a rental space as a residence and have their business on the ground floor. Next slide, please. Partnership, affordable housing. We have had several, several discussions and the county ha have been made aware of this, of looking at a specific affordable housing provider, Indwell. They are a proven affordable housing provider as shown on the plan. And we indicated there's a proposed building between 35 and 45 residential units. That would be part of this proposal. Think about it, 45 affordable housing. We also have two mixed use buildings, which could be rental or could be part of a CMHC program, which we're looking at and evaluating. Again, 72 residential units are proposed. If, next slide, please. Partnership, the implementation of public policy, support the continuum housing, single detached, street towns, condominium towns, apartments. Those, I think that's important in that this, in this one block, we're providing that mix of housing. Certainly the houses would be efficient in their energy, which is important. They would be of a good quality, quality design, either through the builder or through the urban design manual. We'll provide for pedestrian connectivity. It's an appropriate infill. It's an appropriate intensification of that property. We've done studies. There's no issue of not being compatible with what's around it, including existing employment lands. It will be phased and it won't all occur at the same time. Next slide, please. Before I get the questions, uh, it's a question that came up. Within the report prepared by w w Watson, there's a section of that report under section 7.2, which is a summary of what an MCR, which you're involved in, as outlined within the provincial 
policy statement and the provincial growth plan under the circumstances of conversion of employment land. When I reviewed the report and I reviewed the what was outlined in that report and I asked that you turn to that section when you have a free moment, you will see that this request can meet all of those conversion policies. I now turn it over to Mr. Stewart. Thanks, Douglas. Uh, I don't want to reiterate too much of his presentation, but um, as he mentioned, we strongly feel uh, based on the history uh, of the previous approved MCR, um, we hope that these conversion, uh, the conversion of the lands could be completed. Uh, we feel it'll tie in uh, as per the area study very well acting almost as that buffer, um, the way we've staged that on that concept plan uh, to the current and future residential that will be built in the area and um, not have employment uses directly next to them instead. Uh, we fully support the creation of the Strategic Employment Land Reserve um, by the 403. Um, we think it's fantastic uh, in that location uh, and it would make um, uh, much less of an impact uh, with that down there than uh, uh, on the 4.2 hectares we're looking at converting here um, and also limit any traffic from the north end uh, coming in through um, a truck traffic uh, into the downtown to the highway. Uh, and as Douglas mentioned, we, we plan on adding that variety of housing, which includes the single family, freehold townhome, condo towns. And again, we're looking at the two story town along with the, the bungalow towns uh, in certain areas that we've done on Cedar Street, some of you are aware of. Um, and of course the apartments. And as you know, from the beginning of our discussions with, uh, with county staff and council, we've been fully committed to the uh, affordable housing aspect of this development, um, uh, working closely with Indwell. Uh, obviously, there's still a few approvals to get through before we can have things finalized. But uh, again, uh, fully committed. Uh, we think it's a great addition to the north end of Paris and could complement the existing building on Trillium, uh, Trillium Way that I think you guys are also looking at um, a doubling, which is fantastic. Um, and I just wanted to note if the partnership does not formalize fully with Indwell, there are other options, including uh, CMHC that we are looking at uh, with Pinevest and work, working directly with the county and the city uh, to deliver on the proposal. So there's, there's quite a few options there. And, and again, we, we look forward to the, the partnership of it all working together on, on uh, how this uh, could come into fruition. So thank you again uh, for your time and, and look forward to any questions. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Does your proposal come with a bridge by chance? <laughs> Seeing that it does, that makes it easier, yes. <laughs> Councillor, how is your first, please? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to the delegation. Um, you know, I'm, I am generally against employment conversions and I'm also generally against uh, more houses in the North End of Paris. However, that said, um, I'm also very conscious of the fact that the last time any affordable housing or even modest housing was built in the north end of Paris was Trillium. And I was 12 years old when that was built. And that was a long time ago. Um, and so we are due for some, some uh, affordable housing and modest housing opportunities in the North End. Um, so I, I, I am interested in this. My question is not for, for Bob. My question is for staff. Um, if we're to support this type of, of uh, request, and this, this is nothing personal against Bob Stewart. I think Bob you know, Bob's a nice guy and, and we do trust him, but I, in the process of going through these, these, these types of requests, I'd like to know if, is there a mechanism, again, I use the word mechanism, whereby we can, we can uh, approve with strings attached. I, I would not want to see a situation where, where if we approved it uh, two or three years down the line, things change and it, and it turns out there's, there's a bunch of, you know, $700,000 uh, condos uh, <laughs> along in, in that property. So I'm just wondering, uh, from staff about the process on that. Thank you. Jennifer? Uh, through you, Mayor Bailey, to Councillor House. Um, in terms of an affordable housing concept, um, and, and this is an employment land conversion, uh, Councillor House brought up a very good point. How do we make a developer do something? Um, because we have a policy, but you know our, our policies are just 
generalized. I think it would have to come down to an agreement with the with the county. And also we'd have to write something into our official plan if this does go through, that we'd have to do a site specific policy area for, for this. We've tried to eliminate as many of those as we can with new policies, but I think something like a site specific policy to word in affordable housing and then an agreement uh, with, with the county would probably be amenable. Um, but I don't know if anyone from senior management can jump in if there's another type of agreement, but those are from a policy perspective what we could do. Thank you. Quick follow up, Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Um, thanks. Um, so thank you, Jennifer. I'm trusting uh, Bob that those types of strings attached would be uh, acceptable to you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I had, um, we had spoken, uh, uh, Douglas and I kind of together on how we could put some, uh, some weight behind it. And, yeah. and Douglas, of course, went right to the site specific uh, policy. Um, also, obviously, if this were to come as an application, you could include it on a draft condition, maybe, or um, uh, site specific zoning. Um, uh, but again, this, if that's the way we're, we're definitely comfortable with, with uh, securing it that way. Okay, thank, thank you. And, and Mr. May, I'll, I'll wrap up uh, my comments just by, by pointing out that if for anyone who's not familiar with this parcel of land, it is literally on the borderline between employment and residential. Um, it's, it's, it's literally right there. And we, we all received in the municipal Cons comprehensive review, we received this uh, chart uh, that evaluated um, this, this property. And I, I point out that uh, the score on it for this discussion ended up uh, four check marks and four X's and which puts it again, right on the borderline of, of I think you can make an argument um, that the, 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 the response from staff was to suggest not to convert, but with a score of four, four and, and, and some, some points on the, the evaluation numbers that, that might even be arguable. I, I, I tend to, to support this. Thank you. Uh, Pam, do you have anything to say before I ask Councillor LaFerrier for the next question? Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to confirm what Jennifer outlined that a site specific would be the appropriate uh, direction and we could we could do that through the next stage of the OP. Thank you. Councillor LaFerrier, please, and then Councillor Pierce. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, we've we've uh, met with lots of developers privately and during public meetings, and we've constantly brought up things like low impact development phasing uh, and the need for affordable housing and attainable housing and you know we get bites here and there but this is the first time that um you know three almost three years ago now we've all met with pine vest and they said okay well in earnest we're going to try we don't have that expertise but we're going to try and here they come to us with you know an honest effort with uh, a, a partnership developing with the premier affordable housing and wraparound service provider in the province, which is very impressive, and basically offering a form of inclusionary zoning by choice as opposed to by force, uh, which I appreciate. The other thing I appreciate about this application is that to me, it's still employment lands. You know, when you're when you have commercial and services, you know, things like daycares and even Indwell, if they come in, they, they provide social services for folks as well. So I see that piece. It's not just wanting to convert it all to residential. It's, it's wanting that mix, um, especially in an area that has, you know, yes, lots of houses, but also factories, et cetera, already there. And we get a lot of conflict between, you know, the factories and the individuals who live near them. Um, so this, I, I think, takes it checks a lot of boxes i know councillor has brought up four and four <laughs> in in one way but it checks a lot of boxes that we've said as a community we really want to see minus a bridge um but it's checked a lot of other boxes um so i, I am going to be supportive of this um my my piece uh, my question i guess to bob is um you talked about other service agencies if the indwell piece doesn't work out the way so i think it will because indwell has been very interested in working with the county and working in the county um and the CMHC piece as well, you know, if those don't work out within a timeline, I guess two, two parts of this question. One, what are some other options you would be looking at to still fulfill that? And, and two, uh, when we're looking at the phasing, 
uh, I understand that, you know, probably the townhouses will end up coming first because of the profitability piece, but where in the phasing is the affordable housing and the attainable CMHC housing in your, in your plan as well? And can we get that in an agreement? <laughs> so. Yeah, no, thanks for the question. And, and just to touch on that too, I, I, I appreciate the comment on the, the, uh, employment use is still being a part of that. I mean, currently we're upwards of 20,000 uh, square feet of commercial on the main, which could include quite a few services there, which is, uh, we think, a fantastic transition into into the residential and behind from the employment. Um, and on the phasing plan, yeah, you're correct. The existing services on Hartley, we'd look to utilize first. That would kind of be part of phase one with uh, some singles and and the towns. Um, and likely uh, the, the affordable housing piece would, would make up phase two, uh, basically bring it right on after that or or with it. And again, it, a lot will depend on how the services are, are installed um, from that end and, and through Woodsley up essentially. Uh, but again, we'll, we'll work through with, uh, with county staff on that, but uh, more than happy to include that uh, somehow in, in part of the agreement that it would be um, at the early stages of the development. And again, there, there, we, are, we understand there's capacity uh, potential constraints in the area. We're working through with staff on that. Uh, as Douglas mentioned, it will be phased and it won't happen overnight by any means. It's, uh, it's going to be a process. Um, and then on the, the other piece, yeah, Indwell definitely tried and true. We'd, we'd love to work with them. They're interested in working in the, um, in the county, in the city. Uh, they had some fantastic meetings from the developer information sessions that uh, staff put on. And, and uh, Graham, Graham's uh, fantastic at, at, at uh, kind of showing how you can do it. So uh, that would be the ideal partnership on it. Uh, CMHC, we've, we've spoken with them. Uh, we haven't, this is still new territory for us, uh, but again, that partnership connection with the CMHC would likely come with uh, a, a, uh, almost a contracted builder that's done this before, and we'd work with them on it. And the alternative is uh, Pinevest and CMHC work together as well. And it's, it's us uh, kind of um, going through the process and, and um, completing it ourselves with them. So well, there are options there. And of course, working directly with the county and, um, and the city, I know there's ongoing uh, talks between uh, the joint services and, and how that works. So happy to be a part of that uh, if we can. And, and maybe that uh, also happens between uh, 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 the county and the city and ourselves. So again, we're open to options uh, moving forward. Thank the other you. Piece if I may add one more piece. There's yep. a proposed expansion to your existing park. It could be conveyed right at the start also. Yeah. Thank the, you, Douglas. The other piece too, if I, if I may, Mr. Mayor, really quickly, that I see a portion here too, where we talk about the complete communities, but we're having some issues between North Paris and South Paris in terms of the bottleneck in the middle. So having some additional services where the person in the North end might have a daycare op opportunity five blocks away instead of through the bottleneck uh, and other things like that, whether it's, you know, um, other services or, or commercial pieces. I think that's a piece that's going to be really important to help us alleviate some of the traffic woes. So that, that's another piece to consider, I, I suppose. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Councillor Pierce, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I won't take long here because I think uh, Councillor LaFerrier was looking at my notes. He's asked a couple of the questions that I was going to go for. And uh, at the very end there, um, with adding the park in, one of my questions was going to be, um, you know, if this were to be approved, could we look at potentially building the affordable park first as well as finishing the park first? Because uh, those are two things that uh, that we need very drastically in this, in this municipality all over the place. And I think it's, uh, to me, this is a start for for us as council to start, you know, getting more into the affordable housing, which as I say, we all need. And as far as this particular uh, piece of property, it's true. It's, it's, it's kind of like a box in the middle of a bunch of other things that are completed and then, and there's nothing there. So I, I agree that this will, this will in, in fact finish off. Uh, I don't want to say finish off, but that'll complete that part of the North end. Um, I guess, I guess my only question would be, that if in fact the the affordable housing cannot be in the first part you say it can be in the second is there is there any chance and, and i understand you're talking about the um the the services as to um how you're going to begin the construction on the site is there any way to 
um, I, I'm, I'm going to say rejig the site in order to ensure that the affordable part is is completed first. But again, um, I, I'm going to be supporting this. I, I like the idea of it. And my final point is the fact that if you look at the size of this piece of property, I know we're saying here that we don't want to convert the uh, the employment lands and and for the most part, I agree with that. But if there's ever going to be a situation where I would I would choose to change my mind on that, this is it. It's not a, it, we're not talking, you know, acres and acres of land here. It's a small infill of land within the, you know, within the the, the town of Paris. And and I support it. And, and kudos for, for Pine Vest to stepping up and, and doing what they're doing. Is there any other first time speakers? Councillor Chambers, please. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, this, uh... It is a, a, an intriguing uh, proposal. Uh, again, I caution uh, an application should be an application to go through the process, the, the public process. But this, this is an, uh, just a, an excellent example of why our official plan should not have a policy where conversion of employment lands are not permitted anywhere. If, if this proposal was, was made uh, in the area where the first delegation was talking about, we would be intrigued as well. But the policy, the official plan policy that we're dealing with tonight is uh, what we should keep our eye on. And that is whether we want to have a policy in our official plan that prevents the conversion of employment lands. We've seen an example here where it's a good idea to do that. But if our official plan retains that um, rigid policy of not converting employment lands, then our official plan would, would not be in support of this proposal. And that would, I think I'm hearing from everybody, would not be acceptable. Uh, it, just change the proposal a little bit uh, on that employment land uh, uh, designation to uh, 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 an employment uh, opportunity that uh, had a lot of trucks and a lot of deliveries and the, the people out there would, would, would rebel and we would be uh, uh, not supporting that. But the way our official plan is, is framed now, we are not supposed to be uh, converting employment lands. This is what staff has to look at and this is the direction the council has to give staff in order to allow things like this to happen. So uh, staff may wanna comment on that, but again, uh, be cautious of, uh, of approving what really is, is a, a planning application in an official plan uh, update. Uh, we shouldn't be doing that. Uh, although uh, we can certainly uh, indicate that the, the proposal has tremendous merit. And uh, if it was an application, and it was going through the, the public uh, hearing process for a, a, a zoning change, et cetera, then I, I can see why it would be a, a proposal that would be very easy to support. But that uh, being what it is, uh, have a look at our, our policy framework in the official plan that suggests that this would not be allowed. Thank you. Jennifer, do you want to say something on that? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Chambers, for those points. So I just want to reiterate that the growth plan itself, where we take our provincial direction and we have to have conformity to by July 1st, 2022. So in section 2.2.5, section 9, it talks about employment land conversion requests, because I know in the previous delegation we talked about an OPA being submitted after two years. Unfortunately, employment land conversion requests are only done through the 10-year municipal comprehensive review. Um, it's not through an official plan amendment. Um, so now is the time to deal with everything uh, through the MCR process. Um, as you know, tonight is it's a draft OP. We have written in language um, that's in our current official plan that talks about conversion requests and it's a section in section 4.6 uh, in employment lands in the new OP talks about employment land conversion requests and it's really mirroring the growth plan policies about what to do. Um, but the, the one thing is it talks about the need for the conversion. So staff have presented through Watson's technical analysis, um, a draft municipal comprehensive review with our recommendations, but that is again for draft consideration. 
Um, if council feels that there's something that may change, um, it is a draft technical review, but uh, we've been to you twice already with some technical analysis, but I think tonight we're looking for some direction from council um, on, these, on these items that have come up. Um, we've made our recommendation, um, but we put it to council for obviously their, their deliberation. And Woodsley did score on the borderline. Um, and if you want to talk about any of that, uh, Jamie is, of course, on the line, um, and he can provide further detail. But Councillor Chambers is absolutely correct. We have a policy. It's in the growth plan, and we have to follow it. So thank you. Thank you. Jamie, do you want to say something? I'll, I'll be brief because I don't want to belabor the point. Um, I think um, the the, ch the challenge I guess we have, and I'll just try to be clear why we did not recommend the conversion is because the area, while it is um, what has been described as on the uh, edge of the employment area, it is still within the employment area. So there is, in my opinion, a distinction between on the fringe uh, or within an employment area. It's not, it's not separated from the employment precinct. Uh, it's not fragmented or separated in any way. The, um, I think the challenge is that even though um, I think we're all very supportive of providing opportunities for affordable housing, it's not so much the broader concept of the need for affordable housing. It's just that right, uh, at this moment, there is surplus of residential land. This may not be the, the area to be uh, looking for affordable housing. It may be that there are other sites where you have a surplus or you have lands that are already designated for residential where you could find an opportunity to, um, to pursue an affordable housing um, option. So that's largely the, uh, the reason why we came to the conclusion we came to. It's um, issue of need and that there's, um, it's a, uh, there is risk to further under when you when you start to. There's, I guess I'll say one more thing. There's there's risk when you start to uh, convert that you you can undermine the employment area and you're also setting a precedent. So if you do convert this area, you do have to keep in mind that you have to be very clear why you think this area is essentially um, uh, an area that deserves merit to um, be converted, while the other applications uh, do not, because essentially. Um, the conditions can be argued to be very similar in some ways amongst all the sites that we looked at. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Councillor Bell, you're next, please. And then Councillor Bell. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just want to give my support to this proposal. Uh, I think, having heard just what Jamie said, I think uh, that was a very uh, uh, rigid application of, of the uh, rule set. I think staff and, and Watson did a, a, an a, a good exercise of all of the all of the uh, conversion applications, and and it wasn't that they set off saying we will not have any any conversions, but they went through an exercise and recognised there was no merit in any of these conversions, with the exception of Woodsley, which was on on the line. It was a four four decision, and I would just like to add that no other developer has come forward with a proposal to help us with our affordable housing. I feel that if we were looking at the official plan and step back a little, it's one of the areas of, of challenge that we have. We will not get inclusionary zoning at any time soon. And so we we're going to rely on, on the goodwill and, and the uh, partnership of companies like uh, Pinevest when they bring forward voluntary, voluntary inclusionary zoning. And we, I think, should be recognizing that adds to the, the overall benefit of their application and um, certainly puts it over the 4-4 level and makes it a much more attractive attractive application and absolutely the best of the applications we've seen. So I will support this. Thanks, Councillor Bell. Councillor Gatwood, did you have your hand up? Yes, I did, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Thank you. And I just wanted to comment that um, Jamie said we'd be setting a precedent by doing this. The former council already set a precedent when we converted the Brookfield employment lands to residential. And we um, know what was built there. I think that this proposal is quite appropriate 
in the area that it's being proposed. We have a transit service. Um, there's a grocery store in the north end. I think it ha he mentioned it has to be based on need. We have over a thousand people on a waiting list for affordable housing. So there's definitely a need. And I support this proposal, even though I don't like, I voted against the Brookfield proposal and changing that from employment to residential, but this one I, I can support. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gatward. Um, I'm hopeful for the bridge. Um, I'm looking for a very um, precise motion so that it gives clear direction to staff as to what we're up to tonight. So can I get a motion? Councillor House. I may need help with the precision part, but- All uh, right, take your I, time. I, uh, I move that we uh, forward this request. We call it a request, not an application. That's right. We forward this request to staff uh, for evaluation, noting council support on the information that was presented. That gets Councillor Laferriere, your seconder. Yep. Is it Councillor Gatward? And and we might want to we might want to add that. Um, staff um, review uh, the project with a site specific agreement in mind because Jennifer said that would be the way uh, we might be able to handle something like this with a site specific agreement to ensure the affordable housing or the CMHC housing. So I would ask, ask that that be added as a friendly addition That's to the good, good point. You see that you see that as friendly Councilor House, Councilor Chambers? Mr. Mayor, I was just gonna suggest perhaps staff could craft a resolution recognizing that the uh, uh, majority of council that, that I can see is supportive of the request and uh, I uh, wish to uh, uh, see that it uh, uh, proceeds. So I, I, hopefully they, they can have the resolution uh, understanding where council wants to go with this so it can be consistently applied uh, and, and uh, other applications are not uh, precedent type things. So maybe staff should be the one to craft the resolution recognizing we support the request. Is this a suggestion. Okay, I, I, I think it's a good suggestion, but I think we're on the, on the uh, eve of a, a very good vote, which will also give staff a good direction as to how we feel as a council. So it's on the floor, we have a seconder. If there's nothing else to be said, all those in favor, including the friendly amendment from Councillor Gatward. Is there anyone opposed? Thank you. That's, uh, thank, you. thank you very much. It's nice when I, Thank you very much. Something fits so beautifully like that. That's nice. Thank you. Okay, we're moving on to 4.2.5. Eric, excuse me for only using first names, but I'm really terrible <laughs> at butcher butchering last names. So I'm just going to call you Eric. That's okay. Thank you. Right. Um, thank you, Mayor Bailey. Um, thank you. My name is Eric Salaslea from GSP Group. And uh, thank you, Heather, for, uh, for sharing the screen. Um, um, I've been in front of you a couple of times throughout this process um, on behalf of Green Life Proteins Limited and 2162697 Ontario Inc. for their properties uh, immediately south of the Keynesville settlement boundary. Uh, could you, next slide, please. 
All right. Uh, as you're aware, um, the, the properties uh, total approximately 162 hectares or 400 acres in size. And the properties have access and frontage um, on Johnson Road, um, County Road 18, uh, and Colburn Street East via Papel Road. And on August 26th of 2020, on behalf of our client, we submitted a letter to Brant County planning staff um, outlining uh, consideration and requesting that their land be considered in a settlement boundary expansion for employment uses through the official plan review. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, this slide shows the uh, the areas of the, uh, the green light protein in red and the numbered corporation in yellow. And as you can see, they're right next to the, uh, to the Canesville um, settlement area. Uh, the lands um, are not uh, prime agricultural lands according to the, uh, the soil classification map. And um, also the, the lands, as you can see, a portion of them are, are right next to the Canesville settlement boundary. Um, and if we can go to the next slide. So this, this is a figure 8.5 from the, uh, the Watson and Associates uh, draft uh, municipal comprehensive review report. Our site is identified um, as site 10 throughout this. And th through this map, uh, you can see that the, the site is proximate, uh, really close to the, uh, the highway 403 and uh, it has direct access, well, not direct access, but it has uh, good access to the interchange at 403 and Garden uh, Street uh, through County Road 18. And ease of access to Highway 403 is an attractive attribute for employment uses. And uh, access to the site, um, as I said, is, is through Colburn Street via Papel Road and Colburn Street in this area is a four lane arterial road with a central turn lane providing good access to the subject property. So, and as I mentioned before, the, uh, the subject property is adjacent to the Canesville settlement boundary and neighboring commercial and employment uses to the south. And one thing to note too is the uh, there's overhead hydro lines and gas lines um, that go along the Papel Road, uh, providing opportunities to service future employment uses here. And also, just on this uh, this map, I note that the the area in the I guess I'm going to call it the the southeastern quadrant of the uh, County Road 18 and 403 up just in the, the upper left portion of the slide. Um, those lands were identified in the current official plan as employment land, but now they're identified as, as not developable. So there's an opportunity to make up that employment land on, the, the, uh, on this uh, proposed settlement boundary expansion for Canesville uh, on our, our client's lands. <coughs> um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, so we reviewed the, uh, the Watson um, request and um, they had indicated with respect to the, the request for site 10 that the, uh, the site, uh, the settlement area boundary extension, sorry, there's a typo there, um, is not part of a proposal for an extension of an existing use or business. And as such, the expansion does not meet the requirement for a settlement area boundary extension for rural employment areas. And I'm just uh, I was looking through the definitions of the in the growth plan, and you know, settlement areas are urban areas or rural settlements within a municipality, such as cities, towns, villages, and hamlets that are built up areas where there's a concentrated mix of development and land uses. And um, so the, the policy that, that's referenced here refers to rural lands, um, and which would be lands outside of settlement areas. But through the MCR, there's an opportunity to look at boundary expansions. And, uh, like, and I think that this is, is a case where um, it's more in keeping with policy 2.2.8 um, of the growth plan. Um, so, um, you know, through the, uh, through our discussions with, uh, with Brant planning throughout the, the process, um, we understand that there's a servicing agreement with the, the city of Brantford for the Canesville area and it's subject to the ongoing 
Kingsville Master Servicing Plan uh, EA study. And uh, we understand that that agreement is, is just for lands that are currently designated in the Kingsville area. Um, but I'm wondering too, whether or not there's an opportunity for those lands that were identified, and I'm not sure if they're covered in the, the study area or not. Um, the, the lands that were no longer suitable for development that were designated employment at the Southeast quadrant of, of garden and uh, the garden street interchange with the 403, where there's an opportunity to um, provide, um, you know, service lands um, in, our clients' lands, land holdings. Um, also, um, our client is willing to to um, have their lands designated for employment use, with site-specific provision indicating that the use would be for dry industrial uses. Um, that way, they, they aren't uh, subject to the the servicing requirements and the agreement with the city of Brantford, but may be considered at a future date if, uh, if uh, they could be serviced if, if there's any need for connections. But uh, basically we want uh, staff to consider the dry industrial use. Um, you know, uh, given the locational attributes of this site in particular, the, uh, the approximately 80 acres or 32 hectares along County Road 32, providing frontages, frontage there. Uh, we anticipate that that would be very attractive to employment use, especially given the proximity to the 403 interchange. And um, we're asking that council consider and, and perhaps even direct uh, staff to, to amend the draft official plan to at least uh, include plus or minus the, the 80 acres. Uh, for dry industrial purposes, or if there's a, an opportunity to tie into the, uh, the servicing agreement in the Class EA the study that's going underway uh, for employment uses. And uh, I think that's basically the conclusion. I've, I've spoken to the council about this before, but uh, we're, I'm available to answer any questions that uh, council may have. Thank you, Eric. Uh, are there any questions to the delegation? Maybe we can unshare the screen so I can see some hands. That's great, thank you. Are there any questions to the presenter? Councillor Gatward? Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, through you to Eric. Um, Eric, I, I do believe that this is a good area for future industrial development. And it's unfortunate that the city of Brantford and, and the agreement the county made um, hasn't brought the servicing forward yet because perhaps it may be a good time to consider these lands. Canesville is mainly an industrial commercial area. And as you pointed out, the gas lines are there. There's a high voltage hydro line that runs across from Garden Ave. And it's, if an entrance was put out to County Road 18, it could be a very desirable location for industry as it's not even five minutes to the 403. So I, I think the dry industrial is not a bad idea. We've done some of that in our county already in areas where uh, municipal water is not available. And um, it is a very mixed area. There's lots of natural heritage in the area, but um, you said earlier that it wasn't prime agriculture land. And I thought our staff told me that it was. So I'd like clarification on that. And um, as a 
a future project. Right now we're concentrating on the 403 area, which is a great area to, to have our industry. But this area certainly has potential and a lot of, there's a lot of interest in Keynesville because it's so close to Hamilton and Ancaster. So I think there's merit in your request, but I, I'd like to get that clarification on the agriculture lands. Thank you. Okay, we'll get staff to bring that back to you. Councillor Coleman, while we're there looking for the uh, soil samples, do you have something to say? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and uh, I, I'm 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 quite supportive of, of the initiative of, of the uh, applicant on this uh, project. Uh, my question is, and I and I'm going to refer it to the CAO, is uh, if we were to uh, uh, proceed with this app uh, with this uh, proposal and and went to uh, a dry servicing, does this put us in any uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word. Uh, problems that we struck with the, with the city on the servicing agreement for the Gainesville area, or is this a possibility that this could proceed? Because I've always been a supporter of the dry industry, especially on County Road 25, and I've always pushed uh, staff is that uh, I keep looking at uh, uh, the corridor along 401 there at uh, Cambridge, outside of Cambridge off 97, dry industry. And, and it's a very successful in, uh uh, industrial corridor. So uh, that's my question, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bradley, do you have an answer for Councilor Coleman? Sure, certainly, Miss uh, your, your Worship. I, I don't think it, if Council was to uh, direct staff to bring these lands into the settlement boundary, which is maybe a planning discussion that Miss Boyer would be better to uh, to handle. But uh, in terms of any complications with the, the agreement we have with the city, you know, I can confirm that the, the city has a commitment to provide servicing to the existing settlement boundary to Can of Canesville, uh, water and wastewater servicing to that. Uh, it's up to the county on how we phase that servicing in because there's obviously quite a bit of heavy lifting for us to do in terms of the construction of the, the resources that we require, the, the, the infrastructure we require to provide that servicing to that existing settlement boundary. Uh, additions to the settlement boundary, it, we can't assume that the city would agree to service those additions. So. I think that's the answer to Councillor uh, Coleman's question. Thanks, Mr. Bradley. Jennifer, do you have anything to add to that? And then we'll go back to Councillor Gatward. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bailey. So I can generally ask, uh, there's two parts to the question. First of all, it was Councillor Gatward's question about the actual uh, soils and the agricultural lands. Um, yes. So we can just, just uh, park that for a second. I can call Brandon and he's got the mapping. Um, but in terms of Mr. Popple's request that Eric has presented, it's a settlement area boundary expansion to, to Keynesville. Um, so we have to justify that boundary expansion to include a certain portion of Mr. Popple's lands. Um, we have to justify it to the province and it's up to the province to review. Uh, we've recommended obviously no because of the servicing boundary agreement, but if it's for dry employment lands, um, we do have a surplus of of dry employment land. So that's why we did the evaluation a certain way, but if council wants to proceed differently, but in in the, and we've talked all about settlement area boundary expansions in the previous meeting and policy directions, what we have to submit to the province, it's quite complex, a package to do that. Um, it's everything from the prime ag lands to environmental features to an agricultural impact assessment, which uh, Brandon's writing. Um, so I'll just get Brandon now to quickly jump in to talk about what class soils and the AIA process, what we have to submit. Thank you. Brandon. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, and through you, Mayor Bailey, to, uh, to council here. So just looking at our mapping quickly, um, it looks like the majority of the lands is classed um, or classified as a type two soil. Um, and generally speaking, one, two, and three types are are what we would consider prime agriculture. Um, it goes from one to seven for those who are kind of unfamiliar with it. And then there's organic soil as well. Um, not a specialist by any means in this, but um, it's something that we would review as Jen said, as part of an agricultural impact assessment. Um, and if there was to be a band, uh, settlement area boundary expansion, we would ask for some of that information to be submitted. Um, and we would work together with the applicant to do that. 
Um, the province does require us to, to submit an agricultural impact assessment as part of a settlement area boundary expansion. Um, and that's something we as the county have undertaken for our, our settlement boundary expansion um, in the south of Paris there uh, for the employment lands. We're doing that on, on our behalf, um, but any of the kind of private um, applications for the settlement area boundary expansions, um, we would work with the, the property owner um, to get the appropriate information for the province. But if anyone has any questions about that specific um, process, I'm happy to happy to help out. Thanks, Brandon. Councillor Gatwood, do you have a, a follow up? A follow up. The um, the fact that it's right next to the settlement boundary that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to apply to expand the settlement boundary, do we? If that's going to cause issues we could do that in the future expand the settlement boundary but because of the city's connection with the servicing and what brandon just said why do we have to include it in the settlement boundary i mean uh -huh. it, it, there's a industry out on muir road i don't think it's in any settlement boundary jennifer Close to the 403. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Gatward. This is a land use designation change, and it's moving from agriculture to employment, and we would have to actually include it in the settlement area boundary of Canesville because it's adding employment lands, and it's a, it's a switch. And according to the growth plan policy, that's what we'd have to do. So we'd have to do it now to justify it. Okay. Thank you. Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Councillor Bell, your next, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I would struggle to support this, given that at the same time, uh, Eric is asking us to convert agricultural lands to employment. Uh, on the other side of Canesville, we're being asked to convert employment lands to residential, which we are rejecting. So we're already recognizing something like 84 hectares of industrial land, which I think is at the same level of servicing as the land that uh, would be on the other side that, that Eric is talking about. I don't see a, a need for an extra 93 hectares unless somebody can convince me of that. So I would not support. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Is there any other discussion or questions? I'm looking for a motion. Would I be able to respond uh, to a, a comment and just in terms of the, yeah. like um, what, what, in talking with my client, um, he would be um, amenable to including, you know, a smaller portion of the land um, within the settlement boundary expansion request. And the land, like just according to the, the provincial soil classification mapping, the, the, the land that's you know, proximate, you know, to the, uh, the County Road 18 is class four, and maybe there's a small pocket of class three, uh, but the, the lands, you know, sort of in the other side of the Fairchild Creek are class two, um, according to the, my review of the provincial mapping. So the, um, just to, to clarify, the uh, class four land um, would be not considered prime agricultural land. Jennifer, would that make a difference? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, as Eric's alluded to, we have talked to Mr. Papel and Eric about a smaller parcel to be included, and that was always on the table um, because part of Mr. Papel's lands are very constrained by natural heritage, yeah. um, and some of them are, very, are prime egg. So that was always on the table to include a smaller portion. So yes, that's correct. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Coleman, please. Well, thank you, Ms. Rare. And, and knowing those lands, and 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 um, I would be very supportive if if the applicant was to look at giving us a smaller, I still call it acreage instead of hectares, uh, because to make it viable. Because I I do fully support the uh, industry or commercial industry along. The, the, the County Road 18, which is the old 403, and it has, uh, you, you can't get any better highways than you got that, that to make, to get goods in and out of the county. So um, 
that's my comment on that, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Pierce. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. I'm, I'm just curious here, and, and I appreciate the fact that the presenter is saying now that, you know, his, his client uh, would be amendable to a smaller parcel of land. I'm, I'm curious why we're finding this out now, why that wasn't stated in his presentation, and why only after a few comments of the fact that we didn't uh, like the size of the plot of land does that come out? It doesn't have to be answered, but I, I, I didn't appreciate that comment and that should have been part of his original presentation. If in fact that was the case, it should not have waited until such time as we had said something about the size of the land. Just my comment, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pierce. Eric, do you wanna to respond to that? Yeah, I, I think I had mentioned that in the uh, in previous presentations too, like, like um, you know, uh, our client was amenable to reducing the area, like uh, indicating that the, you know, 80 acres or, or, or smaller parcel, of the, the Western side was. So my apologies for not mentioning that um, and going through the, the, the questions. It wasn't the, the whole land, but it was, you know, partial. So uh, my apologies for, for not stating that clearly um, and waiting for the, the questions, but uh, as I said in my discussions with uh, with uh, my client, uh, he would be amenable to a, a smaller parcel. Thank you, Eric. Councillor Bell, do you want to? I'm just prepared to, make, just prepared to make a motion to receive this uh, this item. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Is there a seconder for Councillor Bell to receive the item? Councillor House, is there are there any comments or questions, uh, Councillor Chambers? So does that mean that the uh, proposal is uh, uh, not, uh, we, we find the proposal has no merit? Is that, and it's no, gone? No, is, it means- that what you're, mean, you're, you're, uh, you're re receiving motion is actually saying? It, uh, receiving motion is saying that it's in front of us, we've read it and we're, we're receiving it as read. Then my assumption would be that when Jennifer said, uh, I forget exactly what has always been on the table, is still on the table and that uh, I'm thinking what was on the table was the uh, modified proposal that uh, the uh, delegation proposed toward the end of the delegation. So if, if that's still on the table, uh, we can receive it and, and leave it with staff uh, as long as staff doesn't uh, uh, assume that by receiving it, we're not approving uh, we find no merit in, in the proposal because I agree with, with yeah. Councillor Coleman that it, it does have merit. There are places for dry industry. Uh, it, it, it's uh, uh, not good planning to put uh, something that doesn't require uh, municipal servicing to a, a, an extent that some things don't. And, and uh, there's places for everything. And it's always been my opinion that we don't have, we can't have enough industrial land designated because uh, it's nice to have uh, industrial assessment. So I support the modified proposal, which I think is still on the table. And I support the resolution to receive, obviously. Councillor Bell, is that your intention? Uh, I just need some clarification because I actually asked the same question that Councillor Chambers asked on item 4.2.2. And I was given a pretty clear answer. And the answer was, we follow what the MCR says. So I think this is different and I accept, you know, Councillor Chambers might be wishing to make an amendment and I'm, I'm okay with that. But my understanding of what I proposed was what was proposed on 4.2.2 and accepted. That was, we accept this report for information and it is as per, we, our decision is as per the MCR that we've received last week. Do you have an amendment to Councillor Bell's motion, Councillor Chambers? I, it, it's a, a funny motion <laughs> in, in, to receive, but it, it gives no indication to the applicant or the, the delegate, I should say, on whether his request is uh, being <laughs> accepted or not. And, and he needs to know uh, what the position of council is with regard to his request. Uh, it's as simple as that. So I, the um, amendment would be that we receive it and and uh, find merit in the in the request. I, I guess, I, but I think that's contrary to what 
Councilor Bell is, is not finding merit in the request and wants to deny the request. And in, in, uh, the, his motion should be that the motion, uh, the request be received and denied uh, would, would make it uh, a lot uh, clearer and then you could vote for or against it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bell, do you want to clarify your motion? Well, please? just if, if I may, Mr. Mr. Mayor, I'm, I think I'm just following the precedent we set on 4.2.2. Because um, I, I, my, I took away from that that we were receiving this for information, but the MCR has determined what the answer is. We're just putting it in the files, and there it is. This is different, and I, I can fully accept that, and I, I, I'm I'm okay with that. My own personal view is we should put this one straight to bed because we have 84 hectares of land to the south of Canesville that is unused at the moment, and in the future maybe we can bring this back. I mean. Uh, Council Chambers' uh, regular uh, addition, and it's a, always a very good addition, is not at the moment. And I don't know how we put that into a motion, but I, I would say right now it's not of interest to us because we have more than enough land. So I, I stay with my motion. If I'm defeated, that's okay. Yeah. Councillor Coleman, did you have anything to say before we call the vote? Well, I, I think I think that just summed it up, Mr. Mayor, what Councillor Bell said that if it's defeated, uh, um, it's, it's dead in the water, and I will not support receiving it because I do think this thing does have some merit. So if you want to call the vote, Mr. Mayor, we'll see where it goes from there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Chambers, before I call the vote. My suggestion would be that I, I agree that it be received, and then uh, Councilor Coleman would make a, a subsequent motion that uh, uh, since it's been received, that we find the, the request uh, we can support the request and I'd be willing to second that second amendment. All right. Councillor Pierce, before we vote. Right. So just to confirm, all we're voting on is just to receive, correct? Yes. And it's never seemed more difficult, Councillor Pierce. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Wheat. Just to be clear, I'll vote to turn this down to receive, and then I'll be looking to Councillor Coleman to make a subsequent motion. Seeing it's in Coleman's area and he's most familiar with that land. Councillor Wheat. Yes. That's, that's very interesting. Um, Councillor Coleman, are you going to stand behind Councillor Wheat? I've been standing behind him for a long time, Mr. Mayor, so. Uh, there's a motion. Yeah, I will. Yeah, there's a motion on the floor that we do have to vote on first. Yeah. Let's see what happens to it. Call the vote. All those in favor? And against? And it's carried. So we don't have to worry about it. Councillor Wheat? And now we can bring forward a new motion. If you like. Yeah. Councillor Wheat, I think, was going to, weren't you? No, I thought if that motion to receive was rejected, then there would be another motion. Yeah. But it sounds like it was, it was approved to receive. That's right. Councillor Gatward, I'm not sure that you're able to vote again. So I, in my opinion, if we voted to receive, it's dead in the water. It certainly is, Councillor Wheat. Councillor Gatward, what, what, what did you think you were going to do? No, I was going to do what Councillor Chambers suggested. We received the information and we can make a motion that um, the we feel that the presentation has merit because of the being printed on the old 403 and, and that staff look at the reduced parcel and bring further information um, for consideration. Okay. And Councilor can, can amend that if he doesn't like it. <laughs> uh, Councilor Bell? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I've been in this place before, on the other side. Uh, I've, I've, somebody else has brought a motion ahead of what I wanted to bring. And when that motion was done and dusted, that was it, the end of the discussion. So I'm not sure we can create a new rule here, but Heather can probably give us advice on this. Yeah, it seems to be going in a circle. Heather? I agree, you, Mr. Mayor. So a motion to receive doesn't inherently turn anything down and doesn't inherently approve anything. Um, if we pass a motion to receive and that's all we do in a night, then we haven't, 
we haven't yep. approved going forward with anything, but if we approve a motion to receive, it doesn't stop anyone from bringing a motion forward for further action at, at any time, tonight or another meeting or, or whenever. So it, it can happen. It can happen right away, right now, with Councillor Gatward and Councillor Chambers. Yeah, because we've received the presentation. We never. Sometimes we add on the end there, and that no action be taken at this time, or something like that. And in that case, it, it's done in the water. But uh, this was just received as information, um, and so I, I don't have any reason why we can't just keep going forward with. If there's some action, council wants to vote on. All right. All right. Thank you. So, uh, Councillor uh, Councillor Gatward has it. Are you are you um, going to second that, Councillor Chambers? I second the intent. <laughs> I, I basically the the wording got away from her there, and I, I'm well, not just. Why, what, why don't whatever. you make the make the wording really pretty, <laughs> Councillor Chambers? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll I I'll second the motion that uh, uh, that. The council find, finds merit in the proposal, the modified proposal, and refers it to staff uh, for uh, further consideration. Are there any other questions or comments before we call the vote? Councillor uh, House. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just, just real quick, and this may be a simplification, but uh, if, if this is the case, then aren't we sending a message to the province that our official plan is saying that we are we are not expanding our settlement boundary except for where we are. Who's your question to, Councillor House? Well, I, I guess I guess to Jennifer Boyer. I like it, it. It seems to me like we our official plan is 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 going to the province with a strong message that says we are not going to be increasing our settlement boundary, um, and then except for here. Uh, and I just, I just wanted to like, it, I, I, that my, my, my instinct is telling me that that's, that sending that message to the province is, is, is not strong for us. Jennifer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor to Councillor House. So I just, before we move on to that question, I just have to reiterate a couple of points. The province has our preliminary policy directions already. So they, the June 10th report, they have the directions that we placed that you gave direction to me to go forward with already. So they're watching what we do with our draft OP. So the direction from June 10th and what we've presented in the draft MCR said that we will not be expanding our settlement area boundary expansions, save and accept for the area around the 403 Rusty Acres corridor. So that was the policy direction that you as council gave me on June 10th. Um, and then we are here tonight with that draft MCR and the settlement area boundary expansion is in chapter eight and it recommends that this is not included. So that's that's where the draft MCR says. So if you want modifications to that, I think you just have to direct staff to look at that further. But as Councillor Howes alluded to, the province has our directions already and now we are making these changes. We just, we would have to justify it as well. And any motion that is brought forward tonight, we will be directing that with our draft MCR and draft OP to the province next week. Thank you, Jennifer. Councillor Gatwood, oh, you wanted to speak? Mr. Mayor, can I follow up on that first, please? Sure, sure you can, Councillor yeah. So thank you. And, and, and thanks to Jennifer for the clarification. And I just wanna say, I, I typically defer to the, the local councillors um, on, on a lot of issues and, and, you know, they're the experts on in, in their area, so to speak. But in this case, I'm, I have a severe concern about us watering down the message that we've already agreed to send to the province. Um, so for, on that basis, I won't be supporting this new motion. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gatward, do you have something to say before we call the vote? Yes. We're expanding the settlement boundary to include agricultural lands in the southern part of Paris. And I'm not sure what class of land those are, but I see this as expanding along the 403 as well, because the road that this land fronts on 
was the 403 until they built the bypass just up the road. So it's an ideal location to put industry and the province has said we should locate industry along the 403 area. And so I don't think they would see this, in my opinion, as a, a bad decision. It's not a road out in the middle of nowhere. It, it, was, it was the 403, it's four lanes, there's lights at the one intersection, and, and there's four lanes all along Coburn Street East. So it's not much different than where we're expanding in Paris for our employment lands. It's just in a, a different location. That's Thank the way. You. Thank you, Councillor Gatward. Councillor Coleman, and then we're gonna call the vote. Hey, Ms. Mary, and I agree with it. We need to call the vote, but I think I think maybe we we may we were uh, premature in making a, a, a decision back there in June about the the four hundred three corridor, uh, four hundred three rest acres. We should have said the four hundred three corridor, and that would have included uh, County Road twenty five, County Road eighteen, and whatnot, and also. Uh, uh, Rest Acres Road, because I think there is potential for this, and I will be supporting this, Mr. Mayor, and call the vote. Thank you. No other questions? Call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Heather? Councillor McAlpine, did you vote? Yeah, I'm not sure if someone didn't vote or I missed their hand go up or something because I, I had I five to five. Yeah, I didn't see Councillor. There's a delay on Councillor McAlpine. He, he had his hand up, but, but I don't think it was caught. Let's do it again. <laughs> all, those, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion's carried, thanks. Perfect. Thank you. Moving on to 4.2.6. Bill from Sifton. Are you still awake, Phil? I am still awake. That's good to hear. Good, so you can hear me. I can. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Bailey and members of council. My name is Philip Mashland from Sifton Properties. We are a real estate company based in London. Uh, we have provided a letter to the clerk that I hope you have in front of you uh, regarding 305 King Street East, uh, sorry, um, King Edward Street, east of Cleaver. Uh, Sifton owns a 65 acre property in Southwest Paris located inside the settlement boundary. Uh, we appreciate everyone's time tonight, so we're not gonna repeat uh, all components in our letter, but we just wanted to highlight a few additional points. Uh, we've got a site specific concern with the excess land supply. This policy is brand new to us. We haven't seen that before. Uh, we do require some time to review this, the MCR and the assumptions made. Uh, municipal infrastructure is right adjacent to our property today. The land is inside the present urban boundary and planned for future residential growth. Uh, significant time investment and effort has been completed to date. Investments have been made based on the official plan. And there are numerous policies that do address efficient use of built and plant infrastructure. And that must be considered in our view. Uh, we do have a concern that the policy, if amended, uh, would result in a restriction of supply for new residential lands. And knowing the market demand does exceed present supply, that would be and could be counter to the affordable housing and attainment housing policies, uh, limiting the units built per year while providing what I call a just-in-time sort of delivery model for new inventory uh, would result in an increase in housing cost uh, and would not provide uh, more affordable and attainable housing in our view. Uh, we have been in discussions with staff for some time 
including consultation. Uh, we've been working with staff in good faith. We are committed to continuing to work with staff and, and listen uh, through this process. Obviously read the significant volume of reports that we have now. Um, and we're committed to do that uh, in the coming weeks and months ahead. So I have no, no additional comments today. Thank you. Are there any questions to the delegation? The... No? Seeing none, looking for a motion. Seeing Councillor Bell. I will make a, a motion to receive and reject the uh, request from Sifton. Thank you. Looking for looking for a seconder, please. Councillor Pierce. Are there any other comments, concerns? Call the vote. All those in favor? Oppo Councillor, yep. Opposed? And carried. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Um, 4.2.7 is Ella Haley. Sustainable brand, better brand. Hello, where's Ella? Hello, can you see me? I can, Ella. Okay. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so I followed this uh, discussion tonight and I'm feeling a bit sad about it as I listen to um, efforts to try and convert more farmland. Um, I probably live closer than any of you councillors to the Papal Farm. And so when I see that discussion, it really saddens me, especially when I know of the the head of the Ontario Federation of Agriculture is just amazing. The position of the OFA on protecting farmland, on, on making sure that we don't pave over farmland is so important. Um, I found an obituary for um, Sheldon Papel's father today, and this is what they say. Mixed farming combined with 150 Jersey cows was the livelihood of the Papel farm for several generations. It was known as Belmont Farms. It sold milk to Silverwood Dairies. Green Life Proteins was the first operation in Canada to pellet alfalfa meal. It was the cutting edge process in the feed industry. So this is a very successful farm that we admire. We admire it as our neighbor. Uh, and uh, I, I guess I just see it as, you know, you're getting closer and closer to our farm and we have to Mr. stop. Mr. Mayor, point of order. So no, sir, no, no other, no other delegation continue? has come up and criticized anybody else's application or our proposals here tonight and i'm I take, telling you i'm take, feeling sad i take exception to this i want want to hear what miss miss haley has to say about sustainable brand do not criticize somebody else's application please Thank i you, am Mr. giving a, i am giving an academic overview of what i'm watching tonight and it ties into my presentation the three key points are no conversion of environment of, of employment lands no urban boundary expansions, increase the intensity and the density of employment lands too, of residential and employment lands, so that we don't even need to expand the urban settlement boundary on rest acres. So those are my key points, but I wanted to go along and comment. Um, when I look at the TCA proposal, I see 30 acres of employment land and I'm looking at possible conversions we, when we convert agricultural land to employment land, we've lost the agricultural land forever. And so if it's converted to employment land, then we keep it as employment land. We don't then with the next OP say, oh, let's convert it to residential. So that's a key, key message through all, out all of this. I'm concerned that the county is short employment lands and now it's planning expansion of the urban settlement boundary on Rest Acres Road. Uh, I, I recommend that you not, through, throughout all of these applications, I'm seeing proposals to convert employment land. On Old Onondaga, we're seeing a proposal to convert agricultural land. That's 160 acres of agricultural land. Um, and I, I wanted to even talk about the employment land conversion discussion on Woodsley. We've worked a lot with Graham. Graham is a founder of Mustard Seed Food Co-op. We supply food to that store. He supports small farmers. He supports farmland. So when I see that partnership, he's a wonderful, it's a wonderful, wonderful organization in well. But, but I do not think if he saw this discussion tonight and knew that it involved converting employment land, which was formerly agricultural land, I don't think he'd be that happy with that. 
Um, and so I see the discussion going, do we, uh, I hear Ms. Uh, Councillor Chambers saying, do we want a policy that prevents the conversion of employment land? Yes, we do. We want that. Um, we have a surplus of residential land already. So any proposals for residential land for conversion from egg land, I don't support. And uh, there's a discussion there. Council talked tonight about the risk. If we start to convert, then we're setting a precedent. I agree with you 100% on that. When I look at the Papal farm, 162 acres is four, 162 hectares is 400 acres. This is prime farmland. Just one moment. And then I watch the discussion and I watch the key motion being made to support the conversion of agricultural land and it's farmers on council, farmers who are OFA members. And so when I look at the leadership of OFA, which I really respect. They're saying, look, we're losing farmland. Don't let, don't, don't allow any more urban settlement boundaries. Don't pave over farmland. Then Steve Howes, I agree with what he's saying. Aren't we sending a message that we're not expanding our urban settlement boundary except here? And I agree with you 100% on that, Steve. So there's one other point I wanted to raise. Um, is that the Blue Lake people, there's a letter afterwards in the council agenda. It's about the Blue Lake conversion, the proposal to convert egg land to, um, it's uh, the proposal to convert egg land to re rural residential. And so the people uh, who cannot come tonight, such, such as Jerry Norris and Peter McCollman, they're saying that the information in the package is not correct. They're saying that the land was remediated. That's Peter McCollman. And Jerry Norris called to say that uh, he's concerned about water use of any proposed development, but he also said there has been livestock on that land. There's been cattle and horses on that land. That land has been used for farming. So uh, those are my general comments. And the key key theme overall is stick to your guns, no conversion of environmental uh, of employment lands, no urban boundary settlements and increase the intensity and density of both residential and employment lands, and then we'll be able to protect more farmland. Thank you. Thank you, Ella. Are there any questions to Ella? Looking, looking for uh, a motion to receive Ella as information. Councillor House, seconded by Councillor Bell. Uh, thank you, Ella, for staying with us this long. You're um, welcome. All those in favor to receive? Opposed. Good night, Ella. Take care. Good night. Bye. -bye. Okay. Uh, are there any other? Because this is an open um, forum, open meeting, public meeting. Are there any other people here, uh, Heather, that want to speak tonight before we we close the public hearing? Who oh, was? Oh. Really, if there are, and if they could just indicate with their hands, um, clicking their hands. I know there's at least one is indicated so far. Oh, my gets me. Just Ella, 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 can you mute yourself, please? Thank you. Okay. Who's going to speak first? Can you give us your name and your address, please, and what you're going to speak about? I'm uh, Mr. Mirror. It's Robert Walters. I'm with Weston Consulting. Thank you, sir. And uh, we did submit a letter on this matter, but I understand we didn't make the council agenda. No. So um, uh, I just want to uh, highlight uh, some of the points we made in the letter. Um, as I've been in front of uh, council twice before on this matter, I represent uh, a client 218-1618 Ontario Incorporated that owns lands north of 366 County Road 18, and also Mr. Danny Denomedicus that owns lands at 95 Old Onondaga Road East in Canesville. Uh, we have reviewed the staff report and in particular the uh, uh, municipal comprehensive or the draft municipal comprehensive review which was attached to the staff report in light of our uh, client's conversion request and uh, we are concerned with the analysis in section 7.4.3 of the draft MCR and uh, the criteria that's been uh, assessed in Appendix K-4. 
Uh, to start with, respectively, we disagree with the overall assessment, but we are more concerned with uh, what we consider to be a lack of explanation analysis and some uh, inaccuracies which are presented in the assessment itself. Uh, in our opinion, uh, in terms of the assessment in Appendix K4, the criteria three, four, five, six, seven, and nine have been uh, incorrectly assessed. To begin with, um, the assessment indicates that our clients' lands are not on the fringe of the employment area. In fact, they are, and uh, that's, uh, it's a black and white issue. It's not a matter of opinion. If you look at uh, figure 7.4 or seven of the draft MCR, our clients' lands are contiguous to each other, and they abut the uh, employment land boundary and the uh, proposed settlement area boundary on two sides. Um, they comprise most of the lands south of the railway corridor in Canesville. And uh, if council were willing to convert those lands south, they would not fragment the remainder of the employment area. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the consultant has indicated that uh, we have direct access to an arterial road and therefore uh, we have access to a major transportation corridor. That is not the intent of that term in our opinion. A uh, major transportation corridor is meant to uh, uh, denote access to Highway 403 and 24. We do not have access to those roads and that intent is actually backed up in other discussions in the draft MCR, for example, in section 6343, where it talks, th talks about those highways. The assessment also indicates that uh, the conversions would undermine the planned function of the employment area because it would create incompatibilities with lines north of the railway tracks. Um, we have uh, addressed that uh, issue to some length in our planning rationales. The uh, railway uh, acts as an actual buffer separating the two areas. And we note that the draft um, official plan, which is an attachment two to the report, proposes a general industrial designation on our client's lands. Uh, that designation does not meet the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks D6 uh, guidelines for separation distances between industrial and sensitive land uses and uh, clearly would uh, allow heavy industrial uses, which would be far more incompatible with the existing suburban residential uses on the west side of County Road 18. Further, the um, assessment has discounted uh, residential use because of the servicing agreement with the city of Brantford. Um, when we uh, began this exercise back in uh, December, 2020, we talked to the project manager at RV Anderson, and we also talked with the project manager at the county and they were agreeable at the time that if the uh, council at uh, Brant County were to consider residential use of our clients' lands, that the uh, EA study, which is going on, could factor in sizing for residential use. And um, frankly, I think the it's being used as an argument just to stop uh, the conversion. Really, the land use should be established first and servicing should be determined after that. And it's something that can be renegotiated if need be. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the draft MCR indicates that our clients' lands are needed for employment use. Uh, the draft MCR goes on to say that in terms of rural ELE employment, only three to four percent of all the county's employment growth will occur in uh, rural employment uh, areas between uh, 2016 and 2051. However, um, we note that previously the consultant has indicated that 44 percent of all the vacant employment land in the county is in the rural system, and that uh, represents 620 hectares. Um, unlike the assessment, uh, previous assessment, which was done for the urban employment area, there was an, uh, an actual urban employment land needs assessment done, which indicated the shortage of land. There's been no equivalent information provided for rural employment land needs. And we have no information from the consultant, which shows that our lands are actually needed to accommodate that three to 4% projected growth uh, between now and 2051. In addition, the assessment goes on to state that the lands have market potential for um, different, uh, so different size operations and employment uses. Um, one of our developers, or one of our clients is a professional developer rather, with large portfolios, both uh, employment and uh, residential, and actually develop more employment land than residential. And there's been no interest or uptake on these lands since 2008. Uh, and that's even despite the uh, current county official plan, which uh, slate servicing for these lands, which is yet to occur and, be, and uh, in spite of the uh, servicing agreement with the city of Brantford. And lastly, there is some commentary that it wouldn't be appropriate to have residential use on these lands because there's a lack of public service facilities. 
is indicated in our planning rationales. Uh, there could be uh, uh, public service facilities provided through the city of Brantford if necessary, and also on our clients' lands if the service agencies require it. So, and given the uh, inaccuracies and the lack of comprehensiveness of the assessment itself, we would request, and, and I think it's fair, certainly in, in terms of the fringe uh, criteria, which is uh, blatantly an error, that uh, council requests uh, staff and the consultant to uh, review our uh, requested conversions again and, uh, and come back with a uh, more adequate assessment. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Walters. Um, we didn't do anything right. It's like we're talking about two different pieces of property. Uh, which staff wants to speak to Mr. Walters? Uh, uh, to you, Mr. Mayor, if you'd like to talk about the criteria that Mr. Robert Walters was going on about, then we can call on Jamie. Uh, but our, the draft MCR is pretty clear on this, that we are not recommending the conversion of employment lands for this parcel. Thank you. Jamie, do, do you have anything to add to this? Because it just doesn't seem like we're even in the same ballpark as Mr. Walters. There's quite a bit uh, here to, to speak of. I'll try to boil it down. I guess the, f the first issue on the issue of fringe, I want to be really clear. I take a very... Um, um, careful look at that issue of fringe and how I would define fringe would be an area that's not within the employment precinct that the major sort of established employment area that we're talking about. Fringe, in my opinion, would be an area that's outside of the employment area. It's separated by a discernible edge of some sort. It could be a road. It could be other land uses that uh, separate it from a larger employment precinct. The, air, the issue I have with calling this area fringe is it's directly located next to other areas that are designated employment. So once you start to go down the road of converting an area like this from employment to a non-employment use, then you start to create a um, potential um, uh, chain reaction, so to speak, of additional employment conversions of lands that are adjacent to the land that you've already converted. So you have to find a way not to undermine the existing employment area that you're trying to protect if you start nibbling away at the edge of the employment area. The bigger issue though is the issue of need. And so as we've been discussing tonight, there is a significant amount of rural employment land that's, that's designated and vacant within the County of Brant. There's 272 hectares of, of rural employment land. And um, there is, um, also um, a significant amount of vacant urban land. We've been very clear to distinguish between urban and rural lands uh, for employment and for residential uses. That's been discussed in the official plan. It's also discussed in the MCR. And it's important to distinguish where we're going to be locating urban lands and where we're going to be locating rural lands for both res and non-res and what uses we're going to be um, putting on those lands and if they're going to be serviced uh, ultimately. And, if you um, if you start to blend this issue of urban and rural, and you start including um, all of these lands in the in the the urban category, then you start to um, create a problem that you you've got a significant amount of 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 land uh, that's available for for future use uh, for. Uh, if you're going to develop it for urban uses. And we've determined these areas are right now, um, they're in a secondary settlement area. They're identified right now as, uh, as rural lands. And um, at this time, uh, there's, um, there's a sufficient amount of land for, for rural. And if we, and there's a, an insufficient amount of land for urban. So if you, my concern is that if you start blending this, you, you do jeopardize your ability to, I think, justify expanding your boundary in the, in the South Paris Rest Acres Road area. So I just, it's important to just distinguish between this urban system and rural system when you're looking at the land need. Um, in terms of the um, issue of urban land need, we've already identified you have a 395 hectare surplus of 
urban residential land. So in terms of the need for more residential land to support the conversion, it's clearly not there because we've identified there's a significant oversupply. We've already identified that in addition to having that oversupply, you've got excess lands in your urban settlement area of Paris and St. George. So it's very difficult to see a scenario where we could support adding to the, the, the urban boundary uh, to support more urban land. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Are there any other comments to the presenter? Any, any concerns? Looking for a motion, please. Councillor Howes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, despite the uh, critical review from Mr. Walters, I stand by our staff and consultants recommendations on this. I, I move that we receive and take no action. Thank you. Looking for a seconder, Councillor Wheat is your Second. seconder. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Any other comments? Call the vote. All those in favor? And opposed? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walters. Um, what time is it? Are we getting close to the end here? Um, it's quarter to 10. Quarter to 10. Okay. Who else do we have, uh, Heather, that wants to speak with us? We have Rashika Angrish would like to speak. Rashika. Hello. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Um, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to present tonight. Uh, I believe you can hear me okay, I guess. Okay. Yep. Um, it's a very short presentation and thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, uh, I'm speaking uh, with respect to the two items uh, on your agenda, which is item 4.3.1 and uh, 4.3.2. Um, on behalf of our clients, uh, both on these properties, we have made submissions just a few weeks ago. Uh, we understand that uh, its staff still needs to review these submissions uh, thoroughly and uh, will reach out to us uh, in coming months uh, with uh, a report. Uh, it was stated earlier in the presentation by Ms. Boyer that a report on site-specific uh, requests will be coming in in October. So uh, I'm sure uh, you will see me a little bit more as we go through this process. But uh, at this time, uh, we request that uh, council can refer our uh, submissions back to staff for consideration and making some recommendations and reaching uh, back to us. Um, that concludes my remarks at this point. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to see you again. Thank um, you. Does, does anyone have any questions to Rashika? Motion then, please, Councillor Wheat. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'll make the motion that both applications be referred to staff for further review. Thank you. Seeking a seconder, Councillor Coleman. No other questions? Oh, Councillor Gatwood, is that your hand? Yeah. Yes, it is, Mr. Mayor. I did, did have one question. All right. Uh, the Greens, the Greens uh, Road um, conceptual site plan, map four, Rashika, you show 24 lots. Is that infilling within the settlement boundary or is that proposal outside the settlement boundary. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to Councillor Gatward, uh, these lands are within the settlement boundary. Um, this is just a conceptual map that is uh, put together to show how development can happen. And I'm sure if uh, the request uh, is considered, uh, we will be coming forward with, de with development applications uh, with some more details. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Good Councilor Gatwood. <laughs> Is are there any other questions? Seeing none, we'll call the vote to receive. All those in favor? Opposed? Point of order. That wasn't a vote to receive. This is a vote to refer to staff, correct? Well, to receive and to, yeah, of course. Sorry. So we'll call the vote again to receive and and, and take it to staff for consideration. All those in favor? Opposed? 
Heather? Uh, it's a tie vote, so it's defeated. It's defeated? Yeah. Okay. Mr. Mayor, Councilor Wheat did not vote and he was out of the room. He, he made the motion. Um, I support you, I had to go to the washroom. I thought Councilor Gatward would take more time. If, you, if you'd like to vote again, we might be able to clarify. Okay, let's, let's vote again then. All those in favor to receive and to, to receive and refer. Yes, and to refer. Opposed? It's within the settlement okay. bill. Motion's carried. Thank you. See, Councilor Wheat, you are still very important. I'm sorry, I had to go to the washroom. Well, let's see. There you go. All right. Are there any other? There's no one else to speak tonight, Heather. Um, I, no, I have no one. Up. I think Councillor Pierce is trying to get your oh, attention. Councillor Pierce, I'm sorry. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I I want it on the record here that I don't agree with what just happened there. There was okay. a vote. It was voted upon. And then there was a revote because somebody was out of the room. I appreciate the fact of what Councillor Wheat had to do, but all due respect, that's the that's the same as somebody leaving leaving a meeting. Well, they were he, not he, there when it was time to vote, and that's made, unfortunate. But the he, vote was had, and it was a tie vote, and that should have been defeated. Well, he made. I'm the sorry. Motion. I want that noted. That sorry. He made the motion. But whether he made the motion or not, Mr. Mayor, he was not there when the vote occurred. So very simply, I could make a motion. I could wait till we're almost ready to vote. I could leave the room for whatever reason. Again, I appreciate why he did, but that's not the point. The point of the matter is there was a vote taken. He was not here with the vote. There was a quorum when the vote was taken and the vote was finished. It was defeated. Okay. That's all I'll say. I, I want no, that on record, please. No, no, and I, I wanna hear, I wanna hear from um, Heather what, what we should do about that because it, it's, very, it's very clear that you're right. So no, it is. Gonna, you know, so yeah, we'll, we'll, let, we'll let people that know what they're going to report as proper answer the question, please. Yeah, so Councilor Pierce, I mean, it, in fairness, it is right. Uh, it was defeated by uh, tie vote. Um, because it was defeated by less than a majority of council, I guess the next step, uh, we could ask for renewal which only requires a majority vote, and then we would vote again. It was just, it's another step, um, but we can do that or we can accept the defeated motion. And Mr. Mayor, and, and through you to the clerk, the fact that normally, if someone is not in the room that made the motion, we would have that motion redone with someone that is present and in the room and that's what we do when we're around the horseshoe but because this is virtual I didn't even notice that Councillor we had left the room and so in essence we were because he was the mover we were absolutely in order to redo the vote because he moved it and he should be present Am I correct? I, I would say that, I mean, the vote was the vote. Councillor Pierce is correct. It was, it's my mistake. I, sh I shouldn't have said, let's just re-vote. Um, we can renew the vote and then vote again um, if we want to move forward in this. What, what if they don't want to renew the vote as a council? As a council, they don't want to renew. I mean, defeating a motion to receive and refer just means that we've taken no action on it and uh, and nothing's happened. So well it doesn't I, it doesn't really change the status of the application. All right. Well way, I think but. I think that we, we have to do what, what appears to be obviously right. And Councillor yep. Pierce and Councillor Pierce is right. So I think it was defeated. Councillor Chambers. I will move for a renewal of the motion seeking a seconder. Councillor Gatward is your seconder. Is there is that is that as easy as that is, Heather? Is that is this the way? Yeah, because it was defeated by less than a majority of council. That's as easy as this is. Wow. Okay, it's on the floor. It has a seconder. All those in favor? 
Mr. Mayor. Oh, yes. Opposed. Recorded vote. Recorded vote, Mr. Mayor, please. Okay. We're having a recorded I, vote. I'm, and, and, and the reason I'm asking is because I, I've got a terrible delay on my computer and I have no idea who's voting for who most of the night. So just so you know. All right. All right. So we're going to have a recorded vote, uh, Heather. Okay. And this is on the main motion the refer, uh, on the receive the and refer. One. This, this is the one for Councillor Chambers and Councillor Gatford. And this is for okay. the proposal within the settlement boundary. No, no. no. Is, is Councillor Miller asking for a recorded vote on the renewal vote? Oh. Okay, right, right. But it's on Rashika's request. That's what no, this, it's the on the process. I'm, it's on the motion to renew. Okay. Councillor Miller, is that what you're asking for? Or for the vote? The actual um, vote? I, no, I, it, sorry, it was for the actual vote. I, I okay. No, I, I don't know. I, I don't care if we record the vote for the okay. renewal, no. Okay, then the vote to renew did carry. So now we'll vote on the renewal, on the right, main motion to re receive and refer. All those and in favor? Uh, all those I got to do the recorded vote. Oh, you're going to do a recorded vote. All right. Yep. Did we, point of point of order, point of order, Mr. Mayor. We never voted on the renewal. No, I know she's doing a recorded vote now. We never <laughs> voted on the renewal, Mr. Mayor. We only yes. voted on for, not against. Okay. Well, I thought we did. Councillor Miller piped in wanting the recorded vote before we voted on the renewal. Before we haven't we voted on the, the renewal vote. yet. We had voted. Well, we we voted. The positive had voted. Yes. We hadn't voted in the negative. That's right. All right. Well, we, we have the clerk here, so we should listen to her. She she should know the process. So how, we how had, do you want to? Yeah. We had enough vote in favor. I mean, we didn't ask for those opposed, I guess, is, is Councillor Pierce's issue. Yeah, that's fine. Proceed. Councillor Bell? So can't hear you, Councillor Bell. Yeah, sorry, I didn't hear any call for a vote. I'm sorry. We didn't vote on. No. We didn't vote on which, Councillor Pierce? On the renewal. Before okay. the vote was called on the renewal, that is when Councillor Miller asked for, requested the recorded vote. There was never a vote on the renewal. That's okay. why it was a confusion as to what the vote, what the recorded vote was for. Sorry to have to go through all this, folks, but that, there, there was no. I'll stop okay. talking. Yeah, well, there, there is, it is confusing because I can think, I think Councillor Miller wanted a, a recorded vote on the first one because he couldn't see who voted to begin with. Not on the renewal. So now we'll call the vote on the renewal. Is that right, Heather? Sure. Yeah, all those yep. in favor of the renewal. All those opposed to the renewal. Motion's carried. Carried. Wow, it's getting. It must be getting late. Now, do we have? Do we have to do something now that it's ten o'clock, Heather? Or well, let's let's finish the main vote first, and then we'll then we'll vote to extend. So the main vote is a recorded vote, yeah. right? Okay. So, Councillor Miller, I, I vote in the negative. Okay, Councillor Coleman. Yes. Councillor Gatward? Yes. Mayor Bailey? Yes. Councillor Wheat? Yes. Councillor McAlpine? Yes. Councillor Deferriere? In the negative. Councillor House? Negative. Councillor Bell? No. Councillor Pierce? No. Motion carries six to five. Councilor Chambers. Uh, sorry, I, I vote yes. Oh, sorry. Then that's oh. seven to five. Oh yeah, we started with Councilor Miller. Motions carry. Holy moly. When a vote seven to five, you know that that six to it's, five. it's when well, you know it's no, I'm just saying, you know, everybody's getting tired when you hear the vote seven to five and there's only 11 of them. <laughs>
Uh, Mr. Uh, Mayor, I move that we extend the meeting past 10 o'clock. Thank you. Seeking a seconder. Councillor Bell, all those in favor, we'll carry on. Anybody opposed to carrying on? If you are, just push your button and go to bed. All right. Councillor Chambers. Uh, and, and Mr. Mayor, I, I did vote against extending the hour. Uh, I, I know there's uh, the importance of the topic and... and uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure who intends to uh, uh, speak from here on in, but there there should have uh, there should be an opportunity, as we discussed at the first of the meeting, for uh, members of council to make comments and ask questions and 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 debate and discuss. And to start that at ten o'clock, uh, like I, I th that does would do injustice to what I would like to uh, talk about because I I could. Uh, I, I've got a list of questions and, and comments that, that might take 20 minutes. And if everybody has that, then the later we go, the, the less meaningful the comments become. So what I would suggest is uh, that a, a, a meeting of, of council be called at, at the uh, appropriate time uh, for council to uh, uh, discuss the uh, uh, official plan update. That's probably a very good idea. Um, is, that, is that a seconder, Councillor Coleman? Yeah. Um, is there any other comments before we vote on that? Uh, knowing that we are going to do um, number five after that because it is time sensitive. That's why it's at the end of the agenda. Uh, Councillor McAlpine. Well, that's voting? what I, I was concerned about because of the time sensitive, whether we need to make a decision tonight. Yeah. And that would be, yeah. Okay, Councillor Wheat. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, um, I would suggest, seeing there's no meeting scheduled for next Tuesday, that we continue this meeting next Tuesday evening. Uh, we'll, we'll send that to Heather as a, as a uh, um, first choice, but if it can't happen, it can't happen, but it sounds like it probably could. Um, so Heather just heard you, so Councillor Howes. I, I just have a concern, Mr. Mayor, that the uh, like staff have worked a long time on this and there's a, there are strict deadlines related to submission of the documents to the province. Could we ask Jennifer Boyer for a clarification on, on the uh, impact of not getting this sorted tonight? Yep, Jennifer. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bailey, through uh, to Councillor House. That's an excellent question. Um, staff are wanting some direction from Council to endorse the draft OP to send it to province for review. If we don't do that in the next couple of weeks, we're going to miss the time frame. Um, we... It's a 90 day one window review that will take us to August, September, the end of October. We won't be able to get a final to you um, by January and we're going to miss the, the time frame. This is, uh, we'll have to figure out if it doesn't go tonight, um, we, we may not make the conformity date and we'll have an appealable official plan. Thank you. Well, I, I can meet as soon as tomorrow. Councillor Wheat? If, if we got together on a regular Tuesday night, we'd still be within that two week frame because next Tuesday is just five days away. Jennifer is next. Next Tuesday, do it for you. Well, I personally am free, uh, Mayor Bailey. Um, I'd have to ask uh, our clerk, Heather, and also Michael Bradley as well, um, if that's right. something appealable. I know our staff are, but I will uh, uh, let that go to our CAO and clerk. Okay, just Councillor House has something and Councillor Bell has something first. Oh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. No, I just I just wanted to, to clarify um, the, you know, if, if whatever is going to happen tonight happens Tuesday night instead, are we still good? The last thing we want is to end up with an appealable official plan. Um, and as I'm very conscious of that, and I guess either Jennifer or, or the CAO can just clarify whether whether if, if we get to the finish line Tuesday night, if that messes anything up. Mr. Bradley, do you wanna speak before Mr. Bell? Through you, Your Worships, um, I can't. Jennifer will have to speak to the uh, the time, the provincial timelines on the official plan. I can speak more. I, I, I mean, 
I know we have a lot of people off next week. So uh, I, I am free on Tuesday night and I can clerk the meeting. I think our clerk's heading out and we are short of deputy clerk right now. So, um, so I can clerk uh, Tuesday night. I'm still uh, delegated as a deputy clerk. And, um, but I, uh, I may need, <laughs> it may be rough uh, for us to, to, to cobble that together. We can give it a good shot, um, but Jennifer can speak to the, uh, to the, um, would it would it be more rough? Would it would it be more rough than the last half hour, Mr. Bradley? <laughs> yeah. I'm not touching that, Mr. Mayor. So, J Jennifer, what do you think? Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Michael and Mr. Mayor. I was just notified. Uh, we just did some research. If we declare uh, Tuesday night a public meeting, we have to re-notify the public, and we have to re-advertise. Um, so that that may put a wrench in in us doing the public meeting for for Tuesday. If this is an extension, we'd have to ask the clerk, Heather, if this is an extension onto tonight. Um, I know in other municipalities, these debates on official plans go over many days. Um, so it would, we could declare an extension to the council meeting. Um, I know other municipalities do that for official plans because there's so many delegations, but I have to refer to our clerk if we're able to do that. Otherwise, we're gonna have to re-notify the public uh, through an announcement Okay, Heather. I would say that council could move to to um, conclude this meeting to reconvene uh, to continue this meeting on Tuesday night, um, and that would just be a continuation of tonight's session rather than a, a whole new public hearing meeting. But that would we've never we've never done this before. But I would expect that council could make that resolution. Okay, we have Councillor Bell, and then we have Councillor Chambers. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'm uh, actually, I booked a holiday for next week about six months ago on the basic assumption that August was a holiday for the, the council. Um, I would appreciate if we could have the follow-up of this meeting a week later when I will be back. I have no idea whether I'm going to have internet connection where I'm going. Councillor Chambers. And then Councillor Howard. I just feel that uh, starting a, a council discussion on uh, uh, this particular topic with that's two volumes long and with 11 councils that all want to have input, and I think they should, starting it at 10 o'clock at night uh, is unproductive. I'm, I'm willing to meet anytime, anywhere, as long as it meets the time frames uh, where everyone can participate and uh, the provincial government uh, is uh, satisfied with the time frames. Thank you, Councillor House. Well, just thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just, you know, we're getting, this starts to get into shaky territory because, you know, so Councillor Bell's away next week. I'm away the week after that. Um, everybody's gonna be away sometime. We got staff away. I, I, and this is too important of an issue with deadlines that are too important. We don't want an, an appealable, official plan. I, I, I'm, I'm leaning towards let's plow on. I understand Councillor Chambers argument, but, but um, if, if, if we plow on for another hour or two and that gets us done, then, then we're done. Councillor Gatward and then Thank Councillor you, Bell. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I'm going to be away, but I have internet where I'm going. And and Jennifer did say we had to get it done within the next two weeks. So we've got options here. I don't know who all is away and not away. Uh, maybe that's better for the clerk if she's back to do it week two. Um, Councillor Howes, you said you were going to be away. Are, is there internet where you're going? Uh, limited. Yeah, Councillor Bell and then Councillor Coleman, please. Mine is too, but I'm willing to try. Uh, just a suggestion, can we do it tomorrow? Councillor Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, I don't go away, but I work tomorrow. I work seven days a week. And I'm disappointed is that I see the mood that we were in the last half hour and you want to go into discussion in the next couple hours? No way. I fully agree with Councillor Chambers. This needs to start at, a, at an appropriate time. I will make a motion that we suspend the night's meeting and start at an appropriate time to let the clerk pick the time that works with Jennifer, seeking a seconder. 
Seeking a seconder. Councillor uh, Ch no Chambers. That's fine. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's okay. Councillor Chambers. Actually, I actually, Mr. Mayor, I was gonna say you're the chair, you're the mayor, you set the date, you call it work with Heather. You know what? I I yeah, I think the council Coleman is right though. We'll just do it as soon as we can. Heather will tell us when it is, and we'll hopefully all be able to do it. Yep. Um, and the staff need time to do the consideration on what we've referred back to them. Okay, all those in favor? Opposed is, yeah, I knew there'd be, yeah. Okay, that's what we're going to do. Now we're going to go to number five, which is a, Michael, are you going to? Who's, who has, does anyone have this? Your, your Worship, oh. if I could, pardon me, yeah. Your Worship, if I could, I just wanted, Councillor Gower just said that that you, is it, if it's Council's expectation that in this, in this continuation of this meeting, we're going to have those other matters that have been referred to us uh, wrapped up, that's, that's incorrect. Uh, Jennifer and her team will need quite a bit of time to do that, that our, our expectation, I think, is we're going to bring those discussions back in October. Oh, sorry. Clarify that, so. Yeah, and Thank and Mr. Chair, your, your your worship, I can just just uh, really quickly uh, the uh, the the bylaw uh, that's being presented to you tonight is a uh, is a is a bylaw for a, a funding agreement with the province. It's the money we got from the province for a COVID related uh, expenses, and that'll include uh, renovations to the Burford office as well as HVAC improvements in a number of facilities, which will uh, help purify air and prevent. Uh, the spread of of, of 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 viruses and flu bugs, things like that. So, who wants to bring this bylaw forward? Councillor, Councillor Pierce, and seconded by Councillor Howes. Uh, do we want to read it, Councillor Pierce? Do you have it in front of you? You don't. Who who has it in front of them? Councillor Gatward. No one, no one has the resolution in front of them. It's just move and second to, uh, to go th to approve the bylaw, the three readings. That was right. my, Mr. Mayor. We haven't, have, have we seen this item? Like, do we have? Was this an addendum to the meeting, or I'm, I'm not familiar, and I, and I'm willing. I think it's important, but we haven't seen any. What's the cost, and what COVID funding did we get? Does that cover the cost? What Michael just mentioned. That's what I'd like to know before I vote. Madam, Madam Clerk, do you, can you read the bylaw? Or Michael? Through, through you, Miss Your Worship. Uh, it's a, it's a, I think a two hundred eighty-four thousand dollar grant that we've received from the province to do uh, upgrades to the Burford office as well as HVAC improvements to a number of facilities. I don't think we've probably tendered the work out yet because we just got the grant. So, but one thing we need, do need to know is we need to, or we need to have a bylaw to authorize the mayor and the clerk to execute the funding agreement for us to get the $284,000 so we can proceed to coordinate the work. Oh, okay. So without it being read though, I just, I just have, have someone second it and then we just vote. Which we okay. call the vote. Mayor, All those the, by, the bylaw was attached to the addendum, so all members should have it. It was sent out this afternoon. I didn't get it. Okay. So who has it in front of them that can read it for me so we can get through the I, I can read the bylaw. Thank you. It's bylaw 95-21 to authorize the execution of a transfer payment agreement for the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program COVID-19 Resilience Infrastructure Stream. All those in favor of first reading? Thank you, opposed? Okay, second reading, please. Heather, you're gone. Same thing. Oh, Do we have same. a mover and seconder? Yeah. yeah. All those in favor? Second reading? Are there any questions before the third reading and third vote? Seeing none, all those in favor of the third reading? Oh, clauses. <laughs> yeah, that was that was painful, people. <laughs> painful. Um, okay, that's it. There's nothing else. It's bedtime for Bonzo. 
And we will we will wait and hear what Heather has to say with the next meeting, obviously as soon as possible, just so that everyone is uh, everyone is happy and the deadlines are met. One quick Hello. question: Am I trying to find a date that everybody can come? We're trying no. to find a date that's most in con convenient to most people. What kind of chocolates do you like, Heather? <laughs> <laughs> I I just I just wanted to confirm because. <laughs> A date that everybody can come is going to be difficult. So uh, I'll, I'll work with planning staff and we'll we'll find a, a date in the near future. And it will be a continuation of this meeting, right? That's, that's yes, right. we are just, we're basically just recessing this meeting to be continued at the call of the mayor, basically. Yeah. Thank you. Move to adjourn. And to yeah, that point, good. should we, did we need a motion to that point though? We passed one already. Councillor Coleman made one. Oh, yes. okay. To suspend and reconvene. Right. So, so are we technically adjourning then? We have adjourned. No. Councillor Gatwer just adjourned us. We're suspending. Should we be? That's a, we're yeah. suspending. Suspend, yeah. So I, te technically, we shouldn't be adjourning. I think. I think. I think Move to suspend. Yeah, we're suspended. Let's. Uh, yeah, we're done. <laughs>